hadn't really thought much about Living Greyhawk uh, in uh, in years, and uh, all the memories started coming back. And I, I dug out. Uh, we had a we had a guy uh, up in the Boston area who did some merch for us, uh, and I found in the back of my freezer. This is like a frosty mug. Oh, you need to save that for the when we're on the, the uh, camera. The, oh, okay. All right. All right. I'll, I'll save it. But yeah, we, yeah. we had a guy. We had a guy who did some great merch for us. Uh, I, I, that's awesome. I want to make sure I give him a shout out because yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's give awesome. him a shout out. That kind hopefully, of stuff's uh, great. Uh, that, the shield the, question was going to come up too. Where's the shield? <laughs> yes, right? that's, a, got, that's a that's everyone an always wants to know. So. Yeah. Ooh, Patrick, oh, Patrick, you're gonna hype train us already, man. Before I mean, we literally just started. Oh man, we got four people on. We're gonna have a hype train. How's that possible? Uh, my buddy just know. my buddy resubscribed, and Patrick did. So this is gonna expire, which is good. We don't want to have a hype train in, uh, with no one on. <laughs> you can't hype train hey. yourself, Patrick. Remember, it's gotta be three <laughs> different people. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming you can hear us. Can you hear us, Patrick? the browser window to do something. Now I have no idea what I was doing. I'm getting old. I'm hoping you can hear us. All right, good, good. I just want to make sure, man. Awesome! What up, Patrick? Patrick had to finish playing my character for me on Saturday because uh, the, yeah, the no, game ran a little longer than I anticipated. Yeah, so thank you, Patrick. Tim no, didn't kill, Tim didn't kill it's, I mean, eight characters, it's pretty hard. And we were being moderately careful, although John's putting a rope across the snowy road trick backfired on us. And so, one of Jay's friends ran a theater of the mind AD and D session on Saturday that a bunch of us were playing in, and it was broadcast. So that's what I'm referencing here. It's broadcast. You know. Yeah, and, and uh, um, you know, it's t Tim's a little nutty there, and uh, that's the way uh, we like it. With uh, you know, Tim not playing with a full deck. So apparently, the last session, which I missed with this character. 50% of the party got killed. Three out of the six movies. Um, so, the audience, I guess, was disappointed there weren't any deaths on Saturday. It's, it, it's, in, it's, in the, it's in the rovers in the barren, so it's a really dangerous area. With volumes and everything. So. But it's, uh, it's fun. And it's Tim, it's good. It's, you know, Tim, uh, Tim likes DMing it every couple months, uh, you know. So it's good to see him get a whole group of uh, personalities in there from the from the uh, you know from the community. So hey, Kai, what's going on, man? So we got ten minutes before we officially go live. So all right, uh, let me hit some shout-outs here on the one of the dimensions here. Reaper, awesome Reaper. For uh, all them spot uh, there. So now Bones is getting us there. Thank, thank you, Bones. See Bones in a week and a half. She's going to be playing the game too on Saturday. Awesome. This time I think the hype train is going to stick. I just have that feeling. So. What's up, Excel? Hey, Mandy. Mandy, I gotta talk to you and see if you want to uh, stream uh, during the fundraiser. I got some weird time slots left, though. But we should talk. So I'll get with you. I'll get with you this week. If you want to stream during the... Uh... We got nine channels. So, I'll reach out to you. Patrick, you can't... You can't... Patrick, you can't do it. You, you're the ones that did it already. Oh, Patrick, Patrick, Patrick. Patrick's trying to, like, pump it up there. So. I think that'll do it there. Now, look, we got a hype train already. Nice. With 16 viewers on only. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Everyone's still signing in. Yeah, people are already still signing in. And uh, and, and people and Blue Box is still on, too, so no one's raided in from over there. So I don't know how we're going to prolong this one for uh, all that time. Yeah, tell, tell John to wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be here. Keith, it's early, man. It's early. They'll be here. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Patrick. That's nuts. So, uh, hopefully, um, everything, uh, this will be a fun discussion tonight. Because we're going to be, really, we're going to be all over the place. Uh, the good thing is that we all have, uh, we all have access to this great, uh, uh regional gets a tier. We can all ask questions. Oh, wow, Kai, thanks. That was really, wow, very nice. What do you teach? I am uh, I am the chair of music theory at the Hart School at the University of Hartford. Nice. Oh, cool. My uh, I've got a music degree, I think, from Berkeley here in Massachusetts. I always get that wrong, or maybe not Berkeley, but uh, one of the uh, New Mass Amherst. Maybe I'm a terrible host. Um, uh, yeah, so. uh, Ber Ber yeah, Berkeley's a Berkeley's a great school, and uh, 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 yeah, I've known a lot of people system as well. My mom's in Enfield, Connecticut, so I'm a little bit familiar with Hartford, a family in Connecticut. I moved up to Boston in 2010 from Texas, so unfortunately okay. it was two years after Living Grand Pocket ended. Right, yeah, I, um, I, I've got some family in Texas, so I, I'm familiar with oh. Uh, uh, oh, what part? portions of the state. Um, so uh, my uncle lives in Grapevine. Hey, up by Dallas. And up by Dallas, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I have some cousins who are in around the East Texas area. Uh, my brother, who was living in Chicago for a long time, just moved to Austin. Oh, Austin's great. Ago. Yeah, I used to live in Austin way back in, in the day. Cool. Austin is so much fun, I had to join the Army to get my life together. <laughs> True story, 1998, Casey. All right. I feel like I'm forgetting something. I always do this, right, Anna? I'm like, what did I forget? Let, well, last you forget something. And then Sun Sunday was the title. I never changed the title yeah. on that. Well, think... sometimes you actually do. You always Yeah, I noticed that on one of your recent shows. Yeah, yeah, but you, yeah. Sometimes you actually do forget things, but yeah, it's not I guess it's, I guess it's just like it. You got too much going on now that you're a partner. I, well, it is, I'm getting, Casey, literally, I'm getting slammed with, and it's a good thing I'm getting slammed with requests, nice. sponsorship offers, all sorts of stuff, man, it's nuts. Yeah. Um, Cameron, just so you're aware, Jay recently made Twitch Partner, which is some sort of like, hey, you're doing awesome upgrade. He leveled up. Yeah, I leveled yes. up. He leveled up, <laughs> yep. I leveled so up I leveled somehow. Up. Yep. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Well, that's a, yeah, it sounds like a, a prestige class. Yeah, it kind of, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind Which of, partner? It's, there's little, some things that uh, come with it, uh, which is cool, and there's some, uh, I, the activities definitely jumped up, which is a good thing, but, uh, yeah. And Jay's coordinating Greyhawk streamers, you know, kind of unofficially for the past few years, uh, and so it's just a really massive effort on his part. Thank you. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just people being... Saturday, I am DMing for Ed Greenwood and Luke Gygax and Tony Winslow Brill and Eric Menke and Eric Boyd and Anna. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> That's, uh, he, he told yeah. Luke uh, uh, yeah, that he awesome. couldn't cast Mel's Acid Arrow 
yeah, at a bad guy once because yeah. it was out of range. Yeah. And Luke, yeah. Luke was like, that's not right. And Jake yeah. just pulled yeah, out the player's was... handbook on his ass. <laughs> yeah. It was yep. amazing. Yep. <laughs> Luke wanted to cast his own spell and then yeah. uh, nope. he said, nope. Yeah. <laughs> out of range. He was out of range by 200 yeah. feet. I, I was so proud of Jake. It would be different if it was 10 feet. And then Ed, Ed Greenwood, I think he should just be playing like an Elminster clone at first level. That'd be... He's been such a nice guy. Yeah, he has yeah. been. Oh, yeah. Well, Ravalantar's close. He's awesome. Ravalantar's a great off mage, and he probably ha he has a, he has a uh, what do you call it, feel to him. He has a, um, an Elminster feel to him. So, yeah. Thank you! This will... I didn't change any of the pictures here because I got I, I got lazy, so sorry. But I do have the Living Greyhawk cast here up there. That's gonna put the Living Greyhawk journals up, but you know, we're not gonna be talking about them. So Zump, thank you, Zump. Oh, I appreciate it. Man. Thank you. Yeah, Mandy, I'll uh, Mandy, I'll reach definitely reach out to you uh, tonight via. Alrighty. And I let Ed, so Ed can choose whatever he wanted to play in my Greyhawk campaign, and he wanted to play a, a, a class created by my buddy Alan, the Greyhawk Mage. Hmm. So, it's what he wanted to play. He loved, he loved the concept and idea, so, uh, um, you know, and that was a, an honor, and uh, Alan's really excited that, hey, Ed, you know, I mean, come yeah. on. Is there anyone bigger than That's Ed pretty cool. <laughs> Hey, Dungeon. Miss Dirty. Uh, I would love to hear more about the Greyhawk Mage. That's uh, oh, Thank you. Man. It's a cool class, man. It, it's, uh, you have to, um, you take, you basically study, study under one of the Circle of Eight or, or, or uh, um, someone who's like, you know, Alu's dead. So uh, you study under Jawal Severnane instead. With, uh, and you can cast a lot of their spells that are from the, you know, specialty name spells. You're, you're not casting fireballs, you're casting the cool stuff that are, you know, that each of the, the spellcasters have. From Greyhawk Adventures, the yeah. hardback? Yeah. Yeah, Cameron, Jay didn't actually play Living Greyhawk, even though he's like a mile away yeah, from like the New talking. Jersey airport where they used to have cons all the time. In New Jersey, I always forget the region, was Keeland? No. Yes, Keeland. Yeah, Keeland. Uh, when we had the Keeland triads on, they literally had been like away from his house at one point it's crazy isn't it but but he's been running greyhawk for like 40 something years so if you go deep in the, he knows the answer yeah but I, I don't know any you know living greyhawk is i'm, I'm learning uh by the way good evening everyone as we keep on we're battling on <laughs> as we're discussing here i'm jake and lucas zamba with me as usual greyhawk mike bridges and the legendary adam meyer Hello. and uh, joining us for every every living greyhawk uh, discussion we have because uh, he is the uh, responsible person for coordinating all of these, and we really appreciated uh, Casey Brown, Bandit Kingdom, and mm. uh, our special guest tonight uh, from Bissell. Uh, first time ever we've had a Bissell Ooh. discussion, so we're all excited about it. Uh, Cameron Logan, Cameron, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me uh, try and turn you up a little bit. You were you were a little uh, you were a little low there. I could be on my end here. By the way, the the giveaway is all set up. Uh, there, Mad V Lat Lad PRX just said Cam. So someone in chat first time knows you. So yeah, whoever that uh, is. I, I I I know who that is. Okay. Uh, yeah, shout out to Jim Case there. Oh, there you go. Great. Awesome. Well, great to right. see you. Fantastic. People are still rolling in, and the show that um, a lot of our uh, viewers are on is still running in, uh, on Blue Box. I'm assuming we'll see that shortly. Um, so we're going to be bouncing all over the place tonight on Bissell because this is our first time. We're going to we're going to try and find out a little bit about about the campaign, um, a little bit about um, the fun things that happened, some memories. And uh, so, Cam, uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, how you got involved. And living Greyhawk, and uh, you know, if you've uh, if you stuck with it, or you're playing at, at this point, or real life took over, um, tell us a little about yourself. Right. Uh, so I uh, I moved to New England in uh, 2001, uh, and I had come for graduate school. I, I didn't know anyone uh, other than okay. um, people I had known at the at school. 
Uh, and I had always played D&D, &D, so I was uh, um, uh, interested in, in linking up with some some people. Uh, it's hard to uh, uh, find a, a home group. Uh, and, but uh, the living campaign was uh, was there, and, and and in fact, I actually I have it on the shelf over here. But I had bought the uh, Living Greyhawk Gazetteer. I had seen it at a bookshop, and I I didn't know much. Of, that's it. The Casey's got it. Yes. Um, if I <laughs> if I dug mine out, um, uh, or or pulled it off the shelf here. Uh, you would see I, I wrote my, my name in the front, and I also wrote my RPGA number. Uh, and, <laughs> Smart and idea. Just, uh, so, so I always uh, remembered it. Um, and uh, from that, I, I linked up with... Um, they took my number in my... Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, but um, uh, I linked up with a, a community, started going to a, a game days, uh, started going to uh, conventions um, uh, at the uh, uh, at the at the time. I, I I didn't have a car, so I would have to uh, bum rides from people. Uh, and that was a good way to get to know people. Uh, just driving around um, the uh, very cool New, New England region. I was uh, kind of an outsider, but I was able to get you know a lay of the land from from people who knew stuff. Where'd you come? Uh, I'm sorry, did I miss that? Where you came from before? When you, uh, where, where were you originally from? Yeah, well, I was, uh, I was uh, living in uh, Texas at the time, so my story is oh. a little bit uh, similar to, to Casey's. I had um, uh, done my um, first degree uh, down in, in Texas and moved up to New England to um, uh, pursue uh, graduate work. And, in music. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Can, so, can I um, guess your undergraduate degree? Uh, <laughs> UNT. Uh, that's that's an excellent guess. Uh, actually, I was uh, I was at Texas Tech. Um, You're a Red uh, Raider. Uh, to go uh, to go to go back further, um, I yeah I had attended there, uh, intending to be a uh, chemistry major, and I had um, uh, done very well in science and math, but then I just got more interested in, in music. Um, and to, to make the story short, one semester I had uh, done very poorly in my chemistry class, but I'd done very well in my music theory class. Um, and it wasn't just, it, it wasn't just aptitude, but it was like um, in my music class, I would do more of the work. So the assignment would be do this, but I would do I, I would do exactly that plus more. However, in my chemistry class, they would assign these eight problems, and I would do those eight problems, and then I would put it away because mm -hmm. I just I was done. Uh, so it became clear like where the interest was. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I knew people in uh, Denton and the UNT area. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, a lot of cross connections. Uh, the the music world winds up shrinking, getting pretty smaller the the deeper you go. But I'll forgive you for being a Red Raider because I, I like to joke. I, you know, I'm I'm a jerk. I'm an Aggie. Oh, I'm okay. from that '90s time frame when tech and A and M just we had some really ugly games <laughs> right. going on. Uh, but I've partied in Lubbock in the 90s back in the day with some friends so yeah no uh yeah. No, no ill will okay uh, <laughs> that's fine. I, i'm too old to worry about that crap now sure uh yeah i uh, i feel the same way <laughs> uh it, it, anyway so uh yeah i had i had moved up i got involved uh and uh that was my uh, that was my gaming outlet while i was uh doing my uh, graduate studies and you know as i got more involved, I uh, uh, knew more people, I thought, you know, I, uh, some of these guys that I know have, have written scenarios for the region, I, I've got an idea for a, a scenario that I think um, would be uh, would be interested, and I, I, I pitched uh, um, the uh, then um, triad members on it, they thought it was uh, uh, fine, I guess, <laughs> and um, then I, I wrote my first scenario, uh, which uh, came what, out. what year was that? That was year three. Okay. Yeah. So we had um, for uh, for Living Greyhawk, 
you know, Bissell, uh, I, I think our first year we came out with, with 10 scenarios and, um, uh, you know, a variety of things, some really interesting plot lines were developing. And um, then we had, uh, we had some triad members uh, step aside and some new people come in. So, um, you know, they were looking for people to <laughs> write uh, some stuff. Um, and that's how I uh, got my, uh, my scenario uh, in in year three. Nice. So and the, people have I ideas. I will, yeah. I'd like to interject here for the audience that's not super familiar with Living Greyhawk. Living Greyhawk started in 2000, although the Jeff guys tell us that there was actually some events in 1999 that were kind of like pre-Living Greyhawk RPGA events. Uh, and right. then obviously the Gen Con launch in 2000 was year zero. A year one would have been 2001. So Cameron here is referring to the year 2003, 19 years ago. So it's great that we're able to dig into this history and, and, and get this out so that it's preserved and recorded. Uh, but I do have a question. If you move from Texas to Hartford, how do you do that without a car? Because when I did it, I went from <laughs> College Station to Boston yeah, and like... Much. Yeah, no, I had to bring my car. <laughs> uh, well, in, in Boston, you have uh, you have some public transport. Uh, True, but yeah, in, in, in Hartford, at, le at least at the time we had the city bus, uh, and uh, they've done a better job um, expanding those those lines. You, you, you uh, a lot of the uh, areas are much more connected than it used to be. Hmm. Um, you know, from where I lived, I could uh, I could walk to campus. Uh, and uh, that was okay. Uh, and I, I, there was a there was a shuttle I could uh, ride, and th I swiftly learned to make friends with people who had cars. Uh, you were you were kind of a hitchhiking gamer, as you said. You rode with other people to conventions, to play Living Greyhawk. Right, all the time. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's awesome. That's great. Yep. So real quick, we had a whole raid come in of another 50, 60 people. And let me reintroduce oh, wow. everyone. You know Mike and Anna, okay? And I know a lot of you are fairly new to the community, so you know them, them both from Legend of Lore. Casey Brown, who Lee, Lee is not my brother. He may look like me, but no, we're not brothers. Trust me. But I think that's who you're referring to. <laughs> Casey Brown <laughs> is, is a living Greyhawk triad from Bandit Kingdoms who's put together how many of these shows? We've done 15 to 20, Casey? Yes. Oh, I have to get out my spreadsheet. Yeah. But yeah, quite... We only did three last year, but this year we're going to step it up. Last yes. year, I I had bought yeah. a house and moved jobs and yeah. was very busy. So, so yeah. uh, and Casey's really coordinated all these, and we really appreciate it. And then we have uh, and Cameron Logan is a triad from the Bissell area, which is New England. We and welcome, and we've never had him on. Uh, anyone discuss Bissell? And we're really excited about that. But the giveaways, Patrick. I know you started the you started the uh, type train too early, but you added a whole bunch of stuff. So we're going to do two more of these. I still have these controller games, digital copies of the new players archive. But since technically. He popped us way over on the hype train. I'm going to give away something really saucy. Uh, um, hopefully, it's Continental U.S. only, but a reprint of the freaking Monster Mythology book, but... from second edition. Yes. All right for that. It's, so it's yes, a fantastic. Yes, this, this is a fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic. I don't think I ever owned that. Back okay. Then. Oh, you should. All right. Yeah. So three giveaways tonight. Two of those digitals and that in hard copy, and I'll mail it out to you. All right. Sound good. All right, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to get there out to all the new people that had came out of the raid and came in late. So Yeah, no, that's and, great. Yep. So did you get to play Living Greyhawk in Texas before you moved up in 2001, or was Bissell your experience for Living Greyhawk? No, it, Bissell was my first experience. Um, so I had uh, yeah, I, I had some friends uh, that I played D&D uh, &D with um, before I, I moved up to uh, New England, and it was, uh, um, uh, you know, just kind of, the home crew where we get together and eat pizza and goof off <laughs> uh, playing D and D, uh, and I uh, wasn't uh, um, uh, really exposed to the large community at large um, in um, um, Living Play uh, until I moved up to New England. So no Living City. Uh, no, no Living City. Uh, I talked to some guys that in that first year when I was uh, playing with uh, um, uh, some people at a, at a game day, I, I got um, uh, I got some stories about uh, Living City, and it seems like it was a blast. 
yeah that's one way of putting it from what i've heard we we've, we've had some of the older rpga types and older triad who were part of living city on and they briefly talked about it and maybe one day i i never played living city i wasn't involved with it but i think one of these days i try and round up the living Greyhawk people who had done living city and get them to talk about it um, there, there was some um uh, some phrase, some catchphrase from Living City that had uh, evolved among the player base that has stuck with me, and I think it goes uh, uh, "Monsters to the Left, Treasure to the Right," hmm. and that was that was just kind of <laughs> here. Uh, I am stuck in the middle with you. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's. Uh, um, uh, I, I think there was a, a, a sense that the the scenarios had a particular pattern to them. And um, that's maybe what that um, phrase uh, means, but maybe I'm reading into it totally the wrong way. I, you know, it would be great to hear from those living city guys uh, to, uh, to have a little bit more context with that history. We found, well, context is everything, because I, I know like in a show last year, we, uh, we found out about uh, Living Girl Hawk Year Zero and Year Negative One. We, I didn't even know about that. Right. Hey, no. Uh, that was really awesome. I think I think Stephen Randy McFarland told us that that there was a, yeah. a negative, uh, or was it Eric Mona? No, I think it was the Joss guys. Okay. When we had Dave and and all of them on, like uh, you know, I wrote a friggin' book about Living Greyhawk nine ninety nine on Amazon. It is. Da -da 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 -da. And I didn't even know. About <laughs> that. I had to get my uh, cheap <laughs> plug in. <laughs> Damn! I should have had my sitting here on the shelf yep. <laughs> a little uh running joke there cameron but um yep. so you get up to bissell you're in grad school and one of the things we found out it shows is almost all of us were students or grad students because that's the only time in your life when you can pardon my language just fuck off enough to spend 20 hours 40 hours a week <laughs> doing living Greyhawk, you know and not having responsibilities of pro more than likely being married or having kids and things like that. So you said you were a grad student. You wrote a module for year three. I think you said you uh, you told me you became triad in year five. You want to walk us through that decision process on your part and how you how you decided you wanted to do that? Uh, okay, so yeah, that, uh, uh, that, that development seemed like it was a uh, um, natural uh, natural step uh, I had uh, just gotten more and more active with uh, the community and uh, I had um, wrote to I, th I think uh, Raj uh, at the uh, at the year of uh, at the end of year four and I said hey you know if uh, if, if there's a, an opening on the on the triad somebody is stepping away um, you know, I would be, uh, I would be interested in, in doing this. Uh, and they had a, they had a process by which you, you applied, uh, to be a, a triad member. So I, I had sent in a, a statement, uh, and, uh, he, uh, he got back to me and he said, uh, look, we, uh, we're, we're full up on the triad, but we have a plot group. And this is a this is a group of uh, players who um, you know are uh, in one way or another uh, working on developing the plot for year four and for year five. That that year five was a big year in Living Greyhawk. Um, as my understanding of the campaign start is that the the arcs were set that you know we're going to do this as five years yeah um and then the the fact that that, that it went on for a sixth seventh and a little bit of an eighth year was uh um uh, a really nice thing um so they had this a uh, group of uh a group of, of players in the community who essentially you were volunteering to have the plot totally spoiled for you mm. uh so you you knew where things were going you knew you know the, all the all the the secrets um that were brewing behind the curtain oh wow and um 
so so what that meant was um, I um, you know up up to a certain point I couldn't play any more Bissell scenarios because I had been involved in um, um, reading them or you know providing some comments um, or workshopping ideas yeah exactly <laughs> um, so where um, uh, that that when that plot group uh, when I was invited onto that plot group, I thought, yeah, that seems like a a, a good way to uh, dip my toe in the water and see if uh, you know, do I really want to go through um, um, with uh, ascending to uh, being a triad, um, or do I want to you know <laughs> maybe it's too much. Uh, and it, I, I had a blast um, working on uh, stuff for uh, for year five. I, uh, I, I that's my the second scenario that I wrote came out in year five, hmm. uh, and we had worked on that uh, final uh, confrontation battle interactive climactic uh, plot point uh, for the uh, end of December, and it was uh, I think in. November of uh, 2005, um, Raj indicated that he was uh, not interested in continuing. He was pursuing different uh, opportunities. He was going to be moving out of the area. Uh, and so uh, when he stepped away uh, after uh, <laughs> after doing a, uh, a a really great job with uh, the other triad members at the time, uh, Matt Pennington and um, uh, uh, Max, uh, uh, and then uh, Jay Babcock, I think, came on at the beginning of year five. I came on at the end of year five, uh, and was ready and primed to take things in a different and new direction for year six. It's really interesting that you guys had a plots workshop group because I had never heard of that yet. And talking to any of these regions, uh, like typically the triads were all on very uh, possessive of we're the ones that know the templates, we're the ones that can get out the mods. As if the mod came in poorly written, the triad would have to spend almost as much time editing it so that it could be usable as it would take just a one. So in the Bandit King, we just reached a point where we had some authors we liked, but typically I ads would just crank out the adventures and kind of work up it amongst themselves. So this is really neat that in Bissell, you had, I, I'm assuming you guys were also judges. You were essentially slot zero play test these adventures so that you could go out and run them at cons, right? You you wouldn't have to, is yeah, my that's, guess. That's yeah, that's that's exactly right. We uh, um, uh, the people in the plot group would be involved in playtesting through concepts uh, and uh, uh, yeah, doing uh, doing precisely that. Uh, yeah, the, doing doing stat blocks. I um, uh, yeah, I had to I had to learn, and my, my first few stat blocks were pretty rough. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Third yeah, edition. It, uh, honestly, I. I, I I feel like I, I can't imagine um, how other regions did it without uh, a core group of volunteers who were assisting the, the triad uh, to really go through that material uh, and make it work. Those those regions who, who did that without a, uh, a plot group or, or other support, uh, you, you guys must, must have <laughs> been uh, working all of the time. Well, we, we did it a little different in the BK. My story is similar to yours in that uh, I found Living Greyhawk in 2002. I was working in a bookstore, and people came in to buy the Living Greyhawk guys here. I wish Gary were in the audience today, Gary Holy, and he often joins us. Um, but uh, I was like, oh, what's that? And they told me what Living Greyhawk was, and I was like, oh, this sounds great. So I started playing in Bryan College Station, Texas. And I was like, oh, I really like this one meta org which is from canon. It's from I Use the Evil. And so it's the Fan Lair and Chanel's of the Fell Reef Forest for you Greyhawk nerds out there. <laughs> and so I became the Meta Org Hater, which was like this little 
volunteer position where I would help the Meta Org Triad member by writing some of the narrative stuff for our Meta campaign guidebook. Um, and then I kind of would rally the players. Uh, we had the Yahoo groups back then. So I created a Yahoo group, this Meta Org, and, and we would coordinate a little bit, but not, not much. Um, and then from there, I became like an assistant who helped with the special missions. And for the audience, special missions were one-time events for one table only. So um, each Living Greyhawk player could apply to year, but they were rarely granted and they were used for backstory or item access purposes. And I don't know, did you guys do a lot of them in Bissell? We had a pretty robust um, group of uh, group of meta orgs um, where uh, it, it was kind of somewhat limited in, in year one and then things pretty pretty much exploded um, by the end of year two. Um, our, uh, our, our big meta org was a military meta org, which we can maybe talk about in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, I, um, I had taken, that was the position that Raj had. He was the meta org uh, triad member and I took that on because uh, I had, I had been involved in the, um, uh, in, in the meta orgs in a way that was similar, uh, I, I think to your story, uh, uh, Casey. Um, we had, uh, in the collection of meta orgs in Bissell, a standard kind of barred college. And, oh, cool. uh, and I, and I, and I jumped at that cause I was like, well, I, I, I attend music school, so oh, I, of course. I, can maybe, <laughs> I can maybe, um, okay. uh, do something with this, uh, that, you know, and, and lend it a slightly different perspective than, than someone else might, uh, do. That's brilliant. Is that from Canon? I don't think I don't think it is. I think uh, so. With Canon, uh, you know, if you if you look into the Canon stuff in Bissell, uh, it's a feudal monarchy with twenty six knight baronies, huh. um, yeah, and it's so it's it's, it's a it's a little country divided into these very little things. Is it like um, Luxembourg small or no? No, it's like, bigger even, than that. It's way okay. bigger than that. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, is there even 26 hexes on the map for this? Or not? No, it's but it, it's area. kind of, yeah, you have to, every Darlene hex is like 400 square miles. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so there you have it. Yeah, uh, you're right. It is, uh, uh, no, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's good perspective. I sometimes forget how much bigger um, the world of Greyhawk is compared to just Earth, just Earth continents. Um, but relatively speaking, Bissell is much smaller than the countries around it. I'm going to bring it up. And um, those uh, um, those those 26 knight baronies are not described in canon, uh, but the original triad did a lot to expand on that. Uh, and I, um, <laughs> I I wonder if a lot of that was. Uh, uh, Steve Conforti or Dave Harrington or some of the like original triad members for Bissell who um, fleshed that stuff out. And for the audience, this is the entry in Living Greyhawk Gazetteer. It is just two pages for, for Bissell, which I guess isn't super unusual in this book for some of the regions. And the entry for uh, provinces is just basic night baronies, eight townships and one capital township. And then you have two pages summarized, and then that's what you guys and uh, the triad rather had to work with. Um, also, was Bissell in uh, what the Marklands, or what would be the reference, the A, B, and D reference? Bissell's Sheldamar Valley. That right, pretty right, much but, summed it up. I don't think there was much more written about Bissell than yeah, Evard's from was, Bissell, right? Evard's, yeah. but there wasn't like so, like in the Panda Kingdoms, we had I use the evil that we could reference. Sheldamar Valley never got a book like that. Though. Oh, okay. No, so, yeah. so, if it the Undying, none of that touches that area. Exactly. No, Parkland no. Said, Don't touch it. So, so, so yeah. Gary Hooley wrote okay. up in, in Living uh, in Grey of Journal afterwards. Uh, he wrote an article about Keoland and stuff, but the Grand March Bissell area was hardly touched. So, if you take a look at this, you have Valuna to the east, which which protects Bissell from the east and the Lord Mills, and then uh, and then the big. I guess Ket is the big deal. 
with the cat Fish? missile because cat was you know yeah that's, that's mm-hmm. what it was. yeah okay. that is, uh, yeah, Court that's sergeant the, uh, era that he kind of screwed up the area with cat invasion and and stuff like that yeah, was from we'll, that. hopefully we'll get into some of that discussion yeah. and, but this is, and i'm trying to get a cat tribe member on for a future show don't horn words i mean oh okay yeah, yeah that, that, that those guys they, they were great yeah I, that, yep. you, so, you, so, but yeah i'm dying to hear the stories now yes <laughs> so so uh, first off anna mike you've been quiet what do you have any uh, yeah. questions about uh uh the um Cameron in, in, into the triad, or yeah, first I want to yeah. want to hear the what the, the um what can you describe the situation for us leading up to the Living Rahor campaign when they started because this was one of these little kind of tucked away corners that nothing really happened and then I think that Carl Sargent when he in from the ashes when he tore up the continent he kind of gave uh, Thornward and and Bissell a shaking already so to speak in in the war if I'm remember my my Greyhawk lore here yeah a little bit but that you know that this is so what was the situation when when the living Greyhawk started for Bissell's okay so yeah this the situation at uh at year one uh is that uh Bissell had been um liberated uh after having been been conquered by Cat okay Mm -hmm. uh so uh cat uh comes in during the uh, uh during the greyhawk wars uh and uh conquers thornward was at that time the capital of bissell <laughs> and um those um they took the city very swiftly uh and um forced the surrender now the uh the margrave of bissell was a guy named walger and um, he uh, uh, had um, uh, overseen this this defeat, uh, and and upon uh, surrendering, uh, uh, commits suicide. And uh, that was uh, that was something that we kept in um, the uh, um, in the Living Greyhawk um, uh, campaign with Bissell. Uh, is that we. Um, uh, we wanted to to honor that history uh, and to honor that uh, that that um, that that sacrifice. Uh, so we uh, uh, at some point uh, one of the early triad members had come up with uh, phrases you you hear in Bissell, uh, and one of those <laughs> phrases is uh, uh, to to do something in Walger's way. <laughs> and to do something in Walger's way is to do something with. Um, uh, great nobility and sacrifice. Um, so that was uh, that was the situation um, cool. at the uh, uh, at the Greyhawk Wars, and then uh, when those uh, uh, conclude, there's a there's a push um, by uh, Grand March, uh, mostly Grand March, but uh, Voluna I think is involved with this as well um, to reclaim Bissell for. Um, that um, Sheldamar Valley kind of uh, um, hedge money, uh, and to drive Cat out, and the uh, the situation then at uh, campaign start is that uh, Bissell is uh, liberated, but has uh, fealty to Grand March. Uh, Grand March had installed the new Margrave. So the new, new Margrave was a, was a foreigner from Grand March, oh. um, okay. a guy named Larengen. And uh, he ruled from the new capital, Pellick. Our old capital, Thornward, had been divided into four quadrants. Oh, geez. Uh, so Bissell had part of it, Valuna, Grand March, and Cat the other part of this this important city that's on this trade route uh, because uh, Abyssal as a, as a as a nation uh, is really its uh, its role is as a as a crossroads uh, it's at the center of um, the where the Sheldamar Valley opens up to the rest of the Flanace um, but also on the um, the uh, western border opens up to the Black Lunish West, uh, so it's this uh, it's it's this crossroads. It's an important location for trade, and all these powers, Valuna, Grand March, uh, Ket, 
uh, had a vested interest in, in um, uh, trying to, uh, to profit from that. Um, from, a, from a practical standpoint in living Greyhawk administration, um, what that meant is it was very hard to do anything with Thornward because anyone who wanted to do plot stuff in Thornward, we had to coordinate with um, uh, four different triads. Oh, uh, oh wow. You know, the Bissell, we have some of it. Voluna, Grand Marsh, they technically have some of it. And then Kat Holy Christ. Well. So it was Berlin. Yeah. Is and that yeah. it was a divided city, and in Living Greyhawk administration terms, th like I've looked at the old part of campaign documents where it tells us don't use dragons, don't use drow, and all that stuff. Right. Like in the Bandit Kingdoms, we were told specifically you can't use Stoin. It's a city that appears in Gygax's novels. It's going to be a core area. They never use Stoin, so we said to hell with them. Five years into the campaign, <laughs> it just started setting things there. there never told anybody. But with this Thornwall, did you guys actually coordinate with the other triads to do oh, any sort of cross-regional stuff? We uh, um, huh. we really couldn't get much of that going. Yeah. Um. So yes. with some uh, with with some behind the scenes things that happened, you know, while I was still a player and I wasn't involved in the plot group at this point, um, they had negotiated a um, point where Thornward would be Bissell only. So uh, from a plot standpoint, it was a negotiated withdrawal. Voluna gave up their part of it. Grand March gave up their part of it. Cat gave up their part of it. And then we started doing stuff with Thornward. Oh, okay. Um, but that, and, this was through communication with the other regions. We had to coordinate yeah, with the other right. regions, and then it was, um, I mean, it was, at the beginning of the campaign, as you may recall, there there wasn't uh, a robust meta-region structure. No, uh, and, there really and, wasn't. And then, you know, when that developed, uh, I think that helped, um, uh, I, I, I think that helped grease the wheels a bit. Right, we all made the social connections with our patriots in our meta region so for the audience living greyhawk was divided into not just regions but meta region for instance uh, bissell was in the sheldamar valley meta region which was what keeland joff uh run through the rest of them for me uh so keeland uh joff uh grand march uh principality of uh Ulic, and um I feel like Steric, I'm missing one. It was Steric. Yeomanry. Yeomanry. Yeomanry, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the one I got yeah. to play in and I forgot it, plus yeah. Bissell. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah you no, played we, it. Were, yeah. we were pretty far from the Yeomanry, but uh, yeah. yeah, we, we yeah. like the. Yeah, they're, and, they're, they're part of us. And for administration coordination purposes, they would, in year three and later, I believe, they would actually have meta regional adventures authors from the various regions would try and do larger plot points so that characters from the yeomanry would have an adventure in Bissell or the Grand March or Joff or whatever, and it would make sense, right? Because most of the time we were either in the free city of Greyhawk or some other random part of the planet that wasn't region, which made no sense. PC would go from Rook Roost to the free city of Greyhawk and then back to Rook Roost and then like to the bright desert or somewhere stupid um just the way <laughs> well, living yeah. rock was regional well you you spend that extra time unit i mean that's, that's how <laughs> let's not get into the time units we'll <laughs> the, the, that'll just give everyone an aneurysm but so <laughs> so you were able to take back this former capital by actually coordinating with the other regions which it didn't happen enough during Living Greyhawk. When we talked to all these triad members, like we were in the Bandit Kingdom, we should have been coordinating with the Shieldlands and the County of Ernst and or the Pale and whatnot. And it just barely happened. Hey, we were all unpaid volunteers doing 20 to 40 hours a week on this. But B, the campaign wasn't really set up for that. I don't think they quite envisioned that, hey, we could do a Church of Hieronius and it should be Flaness wide. I'm sure you guys had a meta org for the Church of Hieronius or the Soldiers 
Ronnie, because I see that your leader, your ruler in living in the Gaza here is a friggin' Hyroni. Yes. You know, so like and in the Bandit Kings, we would have just booed that guy out of town. Sure. You know, we would <laughs> Yeah, no paladins allowed. Get out. GTFO. But uh, anyway, sorry, that was a whole segue about how yeah. we deal with other regions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, that mess. communication, that communication aspect, um, uh, is was really hard to pull off, um, uh, and a lot of it was done during uh, over Yahoo groups. Um, but mm. I, I mean, for us, we uh, we, we were fortunate. Um, we always had very um, close interactions with the guys from Kewland, hmm. um, mainly because. Uh, New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, that that those three states, um, you know, we would have conventions in um, Stanford, Connecticut, where uh, you know, a lot of guys from Kilin would come in. Yeah. Uh, and it was um, just an, an easy way to sit down in between a slot or, you know, after, uh, after a day of gaming to just hang out with these guys and chat a little bit, like, you know what's going on in Kilin. What's here's what's going on. Well, you're here in Bissell, so you know kind of what's happening here. Um, so in a lot of ways, we were closer to um, Kilin mm. in our just regular communications than we were with uh, we were with Grand March. Uh, but that makes sense in an odd way, right? Because your currency was Kiowish standard or close modified Kiowish. It says here in the book. Uh, yeah, well, Keoland had a profound influence in oh, the whole Sheldamar Valley, so it was. Right. Uh, that's yeah, that's not at all a surprise. They said that multiple times on shows. Well, yeah, with <laughs> yeah. superpowers, so, yeah. And they're still playing to this day. Most of them. I mean, that's the one that's, that's yeah, stuck that's true. all these they, years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Greyhawk Reborn. Yeah, Greyhawk the Greyhawk Reborn there. folks yeah. are from yeah, that right. part of the country, yeah, right? So. And we've had we had Sean Merwin um, and Judy. On from oh, wow. the okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Judy actually games with us too. Um, mm -hmm. Great oh, cool. fun. Okay, yeah. And Sean has gone on to be, you know, uh, a five E wizard. Right. Type. Yeah. So uh, that'll be a future show day where I get together living Greyhawk alumni who are now in the gaming industry as professionals. That's a good one. That's a really and good one. And force them to come on the show. Whether yeah, they like it or bunch. not, yeah, there there are uh, there are a bunch who uh, who started at Li uh, at Living Greyhawk and are now doing stuff professionally. Let's, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's throw a curveball question. Your buddy has just asked in chat, "Why didn't you attempt to get Bissell involved in Greyhawk Reborn with Kia Land?" Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah, that's a question from Jim. Um, <laughs> Uh, right. So the, the Greyhawk Reborn um, came out a few years after yeah. Campaign End. 2012, and, I think it was. Right. So so things had cooled down uh, significantly by that, at least from my perspective. We had uh, uh, we had concluded our our year eight uh, uh, plot line. Uh, you know, I had written my last. Uh, um, scenario. Um, I know um, Jay did a lot in the final push in, in year eight. And then we close up shop. And, you know, from from my perspective, I had uh, uh, done Living Greyhawk. It was over. And uh, I was ready to move on to, to different things. Um, for uh, for a lot of reasons. At that point, I, I think it was uh, a year or two into my uh, PhD program. Uh, I had uh, you know at that point a um, uh, a a stable uh, crew of people that I would game with, including uh, a Jim, uh, and we were moving on to different things uh so you know from my yeah. from my perspective at that point you know living greyhawk that was that was in the past time to move on i mean i well, look 90 percent did 95 percent did that Good. right we talked about the living greyhawk burnout like you were triad from year five i think you said towards the end of year five yeah i came on right at the end of year five so and i was then, there for year six year seven uh not the end of the campaign in year eight 
No, I was there for the end of the year, year eight. Um, year, year eight as well. So a couple of years as triad, a ton of work. What we found is not very many of us went on, say, Living Forgotten Realms, because either we didn't like Fort E or we were burned out or people got married or people had kids. Sounds like the same happened for you as a school. Because of school, um, you know, we uh, I was playing fourth edition for uh, for a while. Um, you know, I, I tried Living Forgotten Realms, but um, uh, you know, it was definitely missing some critical elements that uh, you know, made Living Greyhawk really uh, really interesting and really compelling. Uh, so um, you know, I had at that point gotten interested in different uh, different games, bouncing around uh, different RPGs, you know, kind of <laughs> going through an experimental phase of, uh, of different things. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, at that point, end of 2008, 2009, um, closed down the, uh, the Yahoo group. It was mm -hmm. just kind of like, that's the past, let the past be the past, and then, um, and then move on. Uh, from there. Now, you know, in an alternate universe, had Greyhawk Reborn come out like right away? Um, I I don't know if I would Makes have uh, jumped in on that. But um, you know, at, at, at that when when they started coming out with Greyhawk Reborn, and I started hearing about this uh, at conventions, I thought, well, okay, you know, that's uh, that's that's cool. Uh, Greyhawk is a um, uh, is a great setting, uh, and uh, you know, has a has a, has a lot of lore and a lot of juicy stuff to, to dig into. Um, but you know, is I guess the, the question that I have in my mind is um, uh, a lot of people look back very fondly on Living Greyhawk. Uh, and a lot of times I wonder if that's just the lens of uh, looking back in time and making something that is a little bit more glorified than it really was. Uh, a going back to uh, to that that uh, world because while there were a lot of really great things about the Living Greyhawk campaign, I think there are. Um, some things that you know maybe we wish had been different during that oh, time. Absolutely, and, so, and we we can talk about those things too. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> no one's going to slap our wrists, you know, for expressing our opinion. Twelve, what is it? Fourteen, twenty twenty two. Fourteen years after the campaign no. ended, and, and just I'm trying to get various people who are involved with Pathfinder Society, D D Adventures League who were all living Greyhawk people to come and say how they would do living Greyhawk in 5e, trying to put that together. Talk about the lessons we all have learned since then. I, I, right. Yeah. So yeah. that's, uh, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big question. I mean, some of the, um, uh, some of the thing that was, well, maybe the, the great thing about living Greyhawk was the regional system. Um, having those those regions and having like very specific uh, and defined um, areas where volunteers where triad and, and other people could uh, carve out a niche and, and really develop something um, that was um, uh, you know that benefited from that investment and that kind of very granular detailed look mm -hmm. at a particular uh, place in uh, in the setting it's the world's largest passion project in gaming, in my opinion, because we weren't paid. We were all volunteers. The circle members got a nominal pay structure, but it, it wasn't much. My roommate was Britt Fry, who became okay. a circle member, good buddy of mine, UK Triad member in the circle. So, um, I just, that's the way I think of it now, is it's the world's largest passion project. And you're, it'll never be done again. The regional system, I think they realize too much content without quite enough gatekeeping <laughs> for it. Uh, what what did Bissell blow up in their <laughs> yeah. storyline? Everyone lines? killed because someone. Yeah, everyone, right. Everyone gets, exactly. like, year one triads yeah. get the keys 
to the kingdom, yeah. right? Yeah. And half of them immediately kill their rulers or their bad guys. Exactly. So, so what, what did Bissell? What, what, Let, uh, let's show the beginning. The story... There's a timeline here. Let's show yeah. the beginning of the timeline and then go from there because I think that yeah. explains a lot. First, you got these expressions like a knight in Bissell, like magic among the Bessalars and in Walger's Way. So this is very cool. Uh, um, uh, to to this region and uh, and they mean certain things. You already said about them Walker's way, but when we go to this timeline here, this shows right at the beginning. You're, you're blowing stuff up, stuff up. It shows pre you starting what happens in Thornward. Pelloc named the capital. Then the Living Greyhawk campaign begins, and like I love this mandatory military service begins by order of the Margrave. Right. So uh, yeah, Bissell nice. had. <laughs> Bissell had been uh, known for its border companies. Uh, that was the the main defense of the of the nation, and part of the um, uh, part of what made the Ket invasion so successful in the established lore is that those border companies had left Bissell to go fight in the Greyhawk Wars, um, half a continent away. Uh, that left the nation defenseless, um, or practically defenseless, uh, for when uh, Ket invaded. So the new Margrave, when he was installed, uh, I think the I, I think the public kind of facing for that was um, we're a country with a history of being conquered by foreign invaders. We need an army to defend ourselves. Uh, so, Margrave Larangan made this proclamation. He was going to have an army. Um, I think, kind of on the on the background of that, maybe what one of the things the the early triad was was thinking about is that you know here's here's a guy who's installed in his position uh, by Grand March, uh, and this is his way of um, consolidating power locally. Uh, so that's the that's the kind of first move, and that um, that created Bissell's largest uh, uh, meta org, uh, which was the uh, the Great Army of Bissell. Uh, so if you uh, were uh, playing a character in Bissell, uh, you were required to enlist in the military, um, whether you were a fighter or a wizard or we. We'll take all classes, uh, so uh, and cool. it didn't matter. Like you were going to enlist in the army and um, pay the, the 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 costs, but also get the the benefit of being in this meadow org. Uh, and then from that point on, from year two on, Bissell. A lot of the scenarios are from a military perspective or a, a war footing a kind of idea that you know we're a military we need to train we're doing these exercises we're going on these missions um for all mostly anti-cat uh some of it was anti-cat yeah that's right because we had um uh we had this this animosity this rivalry oh god uh, i would have with, set up a convention uh, where you guys had to fight each other uh <laughs> you, 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 it was discussed many times, and oh. uh, I, I can get into uh, how we went to war with Cat in year six uh, oh. in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a minute. But sure, uh, yeah, that uh, that's another thing that we blew up, I guess. Um, so yeah, the um, the the canon established canon was that Bissell had these border companies. We decided that, or whoever was doing the the triad at that time, because I was still just a fledgling player, I was like, "Oh, oh okay, now I have to, my character is going to be in the army now." Um, I was at that point along with the ride, uh, but yeah, it was. Now we're we're doing this army stuff. Um, the the next thing that uh, the plot line really went into was Evard. Hmm. Uh, Evard's Probably the uh, uh, the the best known character from uh, from Bissell. Not a lot of nations got like a named character in the in the lore who was uh, established in the way that that Eve was. A spell too that was. And they uh, actually let you use him. Yes, yes. So uh, we had uh, we had Evard. Um, 
the the Avard that came out of Living Greyhawk was was very different from uh, the Avard that you may have read read, read about uh, in um, uh, in Canon. Uh, oh, and good. yeah, I think I, I think Evard was actually featured in a dungeon Whoa. article. He was, he was, he was highlighted. They did that. They yeah. did that for a couple months. They highlighted uh, individuals. He was one of them. Yep. Right. Yeah, yep. that came out in the in the middle of the Living Greyhawk campaign. But it and, wasn't yours. We, it was someone else, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, we had um, <laughs> you know, we had players who were oh. popping up and saying, "Hey, here's all these. St 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 here's the stats on Evard." And we're like, mm, well, that's that's, that's someone else. Our <laughs> sure, yeah. that we didn't even know. That's what happens uh, with so many. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, we, yeah. Same thing in the band. Oh King. my gosh. We had the bone hearts that we could play with. I used those bone hearts, and we took their as from I used the evil and converted them to third edition, and then that's we just were always happy. Yeah, they, we should bump them up to make them powerful enough because third edition sixteen level PCs in Living Greyhawk were just ludicrously powerful so, right. yeah but you got to play with the Vard, which is cool because other reasons about well we couldn't do anything with big b or whatever right. you know right. i forget which ones but so, i feel like so, judy from keelan talked about evard a little bit too okay yeah but i could be um, wrong yeah I, she uh, <laughs> um she was uh someone who frequently appeared at abyssal conventions uh so yeah it wouldn't be uh wouldn't be a surprise if she uh i had uh, had some memories there uh so evard evard was our big bad um evard was a uh, cast uh in the um in, in the lore actually it's mentioned in the uh living greyhawk gazetteer uh that evard was a minor noble in Bissell, uh who was disgraced and then cast out and hmm. there's a there's a sentence in there that um part of his in, in, insurrection uh involved necromancers and um i think the uh, the early triad must have underlined and highlighted that word and circled it many many times because that um that wound up being the the defining force of uh of evard's uh henchmen is that they were they were necromancers they uh they raised armies of undead and that's um uh, that's how, how evard was uh exercising his power in the region what what was his goal as an npc in living greyhawk so uh, Evard's eventual goal was to conquer his homeland, uh, was to uh, regain his title and, um, uh, and conquer his homeland. Uh, so for, uh, <laughs> for, for, for anyone who's, who's collected those Bissell scenarios and is going to be uh, playing through them, hopefully I'm not spoiling, uh, ah. not spoiling this. Yeah, me. at this point. Don't worry about it. Spoil, spoil away. away. Spoil away. Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, so um, yeah, Evard... Um, uh, I think it is in year four um, where we had um, uh, gotten uh, Thornward uh, to, uh, uh, to to play with, uh, and then um, uh, Evard probably conquers it. Uh, so, nice. so happy, Did this happy, happen off screen, or was this an interactive or an adventure? They they did uh, a lot of that as a, as an interactive. Um, so yeah, I think I think a lot of regions did this, and mm -hmm. you know, that's that's essentially what we did. Was our, our major plot points happened at? Um, we had uh, we had four or five you know uh, really well attended conventions in the region. Uh, and usually those would have um, some special scenario or some interactive uh, that we would run on. Usually we ran them on Sunday morning. Sometimes they were Saturday night convention slots. Oh, you did them Sunday mornings? A lot of them were Sunday mornings, yeah. Have... Uh, many of them were Saturday nights. Yeah, uh, most of ours were Saturday night. And um, that's when those... Um, 
uh, that's when those plot points would uh, kind of get revealed and get settled, and then we would do uh, uh, a narrative afterward uh, for people who weren't at the convention. Right. We on our Yahoo group we type up a synopsis of what happened for the. <clears throat> for the non-living Greyhawk people in the audience, an interactive was a living Greyhawk event that was one adventure happening simultaneously across multiple tables. And in many regions, the tables could interact with each other. We had things in the Bandit Kingdoms like battle interactives where the fourth level table would be fighting fourth level monsters and the eighth level table would be fighting eighth level monsters and the PCs could choose hey, I'm going to go help the lower level guys. And the lower level guy who got really buffed up could decide I'm going to go help the high level guys. Uh, or we had role-playing interactives where there was no combat and we had 100 people in a room all essentially LARPing whether or not they were in costume. What? Yeah, That's nuts, man. I, mean, I don't know how you kept track of all that. That's insane. It's cool. Yeah. No, wow. there, was, there was a lot to keep track of. So, Cameron, when you had interactives in Bissell, about how many people do you think you were getting on average? Wow, you know, it, it would depend on the convention. Um, Give me your usually, biggest one. Yeah, our, our biggest one would probably, you know, we, we would run um, 8 to 12 tables. Um, maybe a, Persons per table. Yeah, so I, I don't know that we ever got to 100 people uh, at an interactive, but, uh, you know, <laughs> Some, some some conventions it seemed like it well and you, you gotta keep in mind you also had judges who had played the slot zero which is essentially the play test version okay once, that's true once you had judged a table in living greyhawk you were no longer allowed to play that adventure uh excuse me when you judge the adventure not the table so before a convention you might look at be like wow we've got 60 people registered play this event divided by six that's 10 tables of players we're going to need 10 dungeon masters plus we're going to need one bozo organizing and running the whole thing above them or all three triad members or whoever was there that could do that in the bandit kingdoms it was almost almost always a triad member in charge at conventions so then you would have had the 10 dungeon masters would have to play it before they ran it, hopefully, right? So they, they could have fun, they could play it, and then they would have an idea how they should run it. They would read it, but they would have <laughs> done the play test and they might give feedback. So you'd have 70 to 80 people, it sounds like, playing your adventures. Yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially how it works. So yeah, we had m most of the major uh, military conflicts between the Great Army and what was developing as uh, Evard's Army of Undead uh, were done as those battle interactives. Um, a few... Um, uh, okay, yeah, and then our climactic uh, confrontation with Evard um, uh, at the end of Year 5 uh, to retake Thornward uh, was done as a, as a big interactive. Hmm. How did that go? How did that go? That was uh, <laughs> I, I, I knew that. So that was that was a uh, um, uh, that was a complicated one to pull off because um, you know Evard was was statted out as a twentieth level wizard. Um, we had it as a um, uh, as a single table. Uh, I mean, anyone could come up and and get into that fight, uh, but people, you know, would step out, would be eliminated uh, because they were disintegrated or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, uh, I, I think we had two people there um, running and managing things. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a, a, a complicated one to pull off. I... Um, uh, I know there were people who wanted to sit down and, and go toe to toe with with Evard who who didn't get the chance and, and my 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 apologies to those uh, people after uh, these 15, 16 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, I still I still feel a little bad about that uh, just because you know, it's hard to manage that traffic flow. Right. Uh, 
but uh, in the end, we had um, uh, essentially uh, uh, Avard um, facing defeat, uh, went out with a staff of power uh, type uh, situation. He retributive strike, didn't he? Yeah. How do I know that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it's, it's a classic. Um, and that um, uh, that wind up uh, uh, taking okay. out Everyone. Um, characters for uh, uh, for uh, two uh, uh, two players. Uh, Dave Kaiserman and Dan Yanoshka were some of our main mainstay players uh, who were who were there. Kind of yeah, really I recognize there. Kaiserman. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know, he he uh, was a. Uh, uh, someone who was active in our region and, and travel a lot to uh to different regions. Nuts. yeah he's friends with brett and joe selby and from divers and other people i believe uh but, yeah um, he he originally was in that uh kind of a umass area but then he moved to boston so it's yeah it's not a surprise that he would link up um in, in with that area speaking of interactives you got someone in the chat named no 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 sign who said a bunch of bissell boys went down to austin they went to Millennium Con. He's referencing their MillCon. I asked him what year. He said 2006. That was like our greatest interactive where ever. We we did crazy stuff in that interactive. So one of the benefits of living Greyhawk regional system was that people could travel. It it helped create the convention. Yeah. Because without it, you really didn't have content that was different from any other convention. But you know, a, a convention in Texas would have the Bandit Kingdom stuff and a convention in Connecticut would have the Bissell stuff. So you would travel because you could not play Bissell Adventures outside of New England. You couldn't play Bandit Kingdom's Adventures outside of Texas and Oklahoma. So Cameron, it says Dan Y. I guess that's no, no, no sign. And then Dan Y, uh, no, no, no sign said that was Dave K and I. Yeah, Dave, uh, yeah, it had to been Dave Kaiserman. And, all right. And I imagine all right. Dan Yanoshka too. Okay, cool. Um, Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so did uh, did Everett win or lose? I'm assuming it was he lost, but he killed himself and blew. Uh, yeah. So so Evard uh, Evard was uh, uh, defeated, and uh, and the, the lands were uh, the lands were reclaimed uh, for Bissell just in time for Cat to invade. <laughs> uh, so we uh, hey, thanks for taking thanks. care of that crazy evil wizard for us. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, I got to get the cat guy on. Uh, oh, my gosh. Next yeah. month. That's my goal. Stephen Baker, I believe, is the gentleman I'm in touch with from cat. Okay, cool. Yeah, we had, um, I think we gave people a year to kind of enjoy before cat invaded. Um, <laughs> so, um, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a lot of downtime. Um, so, uh, yeah, year six, we were, uh, uh, we were developing the, uh, the new uh, the new plot points and, and we knew that um, one of the things I think I think Jay uh, Babcock was the the main uh, point person okay. for communicating with the cat triad. Um, I want to say it happened probably over drinks at Gen Con. The way Jay uh, uh -oh. the way Jay the way Jay told the story to me, he was like, "Hey, I'm I'm in touch with the cat triad," and I said, "Hey, do you guys want to invade our country?" <laughs> uh, or, or maybe it was something like, "Hey, do you, do you want to go? To, do you want to go to war?" And they were like, "Sure, yeah, that, that sounds great." Um, so that, um, Wait, uh, I, Mike said, "Uh oh," for a reason uh -oh. because every time Eric Mona and Jason Bullman and all them talked about getting drinks at a convention, usually Gen Con, something in Living Greyhawk got blowed up. Yeah, like, yeah. the Ether Threat arc was created in a bar. When they were all hammered, and they were like, "Let's just destroy ten. That that makes sense. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> that the, uh, the 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 ether plot came came out of something like that. Um, no no offense against the ether plot. That was uh, no. We we can a lot of the ether plot was uh, lacking, and it did not <laughs> wasn't sensible. Well, yeah, it was. Um, uh, so in those core modules, and I guess. Um, Maybe this is one of those moments where we need to rope people in who who didn't play Living Greyhawk, but um, uh, there was a there, there was a plot line in the core Living Greyhawk where uh, 
monsters from the ethereal plane were invading. Yeah, that 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 yeah, that's uh, ten. Uh, we, we we and we know that that was dr- a drunken decision made over. Yeah, that was the one where they right. uh, they, they Bull- were ether bugs. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. We heard that whole story yeah. from Bullman, yeah. Bullman, Jacobs, and Mona drinking, or I'm oh, sorry, Bullman and, and Mona. Yeah, we're, let's just do this. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, that was uh, that, that was a weird. The, the thing about that that was weird for me is um, you you would be playing a core scenario that seemed to you know, have its own particular plot life. Uh, and then these ether bugs would show up for seemingly no reason. And they would start um, uh, blasting you with their ether powers. <laughs> and it was like, oh, okay, this, this feels a little bit out of left field. Cause we were, we had this quest to do, but now we, we've, we've got these things that um, uh, came, came out of the, uh, uh, basement that we weren't expecting did you use them regionally uh did we use them you know a lot of regions did actually yeah we're we're guilty Uh, yeah uh, did we use the ether creatures because we were right next to 10 so the bandit kingdoms we had them come across the artonsume river and they started showing up i think they only showed up in one or two things over Uh, drinks but yeah they they just didn't make uh, any uh, sense Right, they had some weird powers. There was the ether spitters. Yes. Um, right. The, and they would, they would um, spit, and part of you would go to the ethereal plane. And it, when you got down to zero hit points, like you were disintegrated in, on the ethereal plane or something like that. Oh my gosh! So there were ether, yeah. there were the ether spinners, and then there were ether uh, the ether hulks. Am I yeah, the, that right. Yeah, they were the yeah. big guys who would, who would mess you up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good times. Um, no, I don't think we used them in any of our regional. I don't think they appeared in any <laughs> scenarios. Did you have any non-human major plots? Do we have any non-human major plots? That is, um, that's a really good question. Most of our conflict was with Evard of the Necromancers, or it was those. Those spies from Cat. Um, we also had um, we had a plot line where um, uh, priests from a uh, priest of Hextor were around causing problems uh, because at one point in year two, uh, the Margrave's crown gets stolen. There was that was one of the um, scenarios you had to go find and return the margraves care oh cool um but uh, the uh, it, it turns out you know your your player characters are, are patsies there because the the crown had been swapped with uh, an alignment changing um, um, thing nice so our um our 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 margrave who as you as you pointed out earlier is a, 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 a erroneous guy um was um uh, now secretly a being called the Chosen of Hextor, <laughs> and now he's he's pulling the strings, and we have this um, this guy who's the Chosen of Hextor, who is the head of this military, and is um, uh, you working out his own um, schemes. I'd rather have a hex right in charge of my military than a Hyronian any day. Agree to disagree on that one, I guess. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and of course that that set up a, a conflict because we were able to to play up the conflict between um, Laringen, who's now chosen of Hextor, against Evar because Evar doesn't want to have anything to do with Hextor. And the Hexrites, they don't want undead conquering the, the nation. Um, so those two had uh, something of a conflict. And, and Larrigan was was eliminated, I think, in year four uh, when he was revealed to be this imposter, this chosen of Hextor. Even though, I mean, it wasn't his fault, but nobody really cared at that point. 
Oh, that's right. We had JP Shepelow here. Thank you, Casey. I, I will. Uh, so we had someone new who said they were in, uh, on from Tuzmit. But it's good to see you, though, and uh, hopefully you're getting some information from this. I'm going to – so I want to ask you a couple things from this great this great uh, uh, booklet here. There's some really cool organizations in here. So, like, this company of the Bright Path, um, you know, and it tells you the requirements. I love this. PCs must be a citizen of in good standing. Can't be a half-work or convicted of a crime. And they were def – yeah, they defended uh, Dim Haven. Uh, but this is the one I really like, and that is – um, here's the investigators abyssal. This is pretty neat too. They're rogues, uh, um, uh, and uh, you know, I guess they're the uh, seeker gatherers. But this night watch here, it says, founded after the uprising led by Evard, these magic wielders, horrified by the actions of a group of necromancers, vowed to pool the talents of the other schools of magic to help fight any troubles. So that's pretty neat. That you have these yeah, the night watch. The, the night watch was um, uh, one of our, uh, I, I think, more popular meta orgs. Because um, you could uh, uh, draw on, and you were specifically tied into that plot of fighting enemy spellcasters or fighting um, uh, uh, undead necromancers, those sorts of things. Um, they had set it up that the Night Watch was an organization, and then the Night Watch uh, is actually the name of one of the Night Baronies. Okay. And there is. Um, uh, um, there is lore that was set up where Nightwatch is a barony that bordered another um, barony, Romstaff, which was um, uh, set up as Evard's birthplace. Oh, okay. Um, Very cool. So, so that um, that tension is you know here's a barony that um, is staunchly against um, uh, darkness and, and undead. Uh, and they live next door to the barony that produced Evard. Uh, so that was a, 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 that was a, a good kind of point of friction that we could play up uh, in the uh, in the plot. Um, Night Watch was our main uh, area where we were able to introduce um, uh, Church of Palor uh, and Clerics nice. of Palor, which which had not really been uh, something in Bissell's lore in the past, but was something that we began to see just in the player base. Um, you know, a lot of people were playing Clerics of Palor, um, and maybe it was because... There know, had to be a this, mechanical advantage? Uh, sun, sun Domain, uh, I think, was pretty uh, pretty solid, um, you know, especially if you know... Um, yeah. That Evard and his undead is going to be a, a, a thing. What was the third edition prestige class that was broken as hell for the Sun Domain? Oh, uh, you know, no, I think it was something. Uh, yeah, it was something keyed into uh, into Palor, uh, uh, yeah. specifically. Right um, from one of the Splat books, there was a prestige class that was just absolutely yeah. ridiculous Radiant when it came to servants. fighting undead. Radiant yeah, servant. So, yeah, okay. The Radiant Servant. Uh, yeah. I love how that just, it took three seconds and someone in the audience knew exactly what I was talking about. Nice. Right, yeah, we had, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, Dan Yunachka is, uh, I, who I think is no, no, no sign, um, or, uh, or maybe it was, maybe it's somebody else, but, but I know that, um, I know that he, uh, had a, uh, a dwarven cleric of Palor, uh, hmm. who was tied into those things. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, and also, um, uh, Jay Babcock, who went on to be the triad, he had a, a PC cleric of Palor, um, and we just, um, had, um, you know, just through osmosis, like, hey, everyone has this, this, these priests of Palor, let's make a meta org for it, um, and let's, uh, let's make it more of the, more of the plot. Uh, let's tell where, the audience what a meta org is. Cameron. Uh, okay, so a meta org is a. Um, uh, hmm, I haven't had to explain this in a long time. How would you frame it? So a meta organization <laughs> is um, a, um, uh, um, a, a a campaign structure uh, where there is uh, some power group in the game. 
uh, and uh, you know, in, in Bissell, our most uh, uh, our most prominent one was the, the Great Army. Um, from a meta region standpoint, the Knights of the Watch uh, is uh, you know a pretty big one for the Greyhawk lore, and also counts as a as a meta org. It's a meta org across the the whole region of the Sheldamar Valley. Uh, but the meta org represents a power group in the game that you, as a player, you could have your character enlist, join, sign up, matriculate, however you want to think of it, uh, depending on the um, organization, uh, to become a member. And it's amongst and that, multiple regions. Well, what? they were typically regional, and then late in the campaign, we tried to do cross-regional okay. meta works. Okay, okay. Most most of the meta orgs were confined within the specific okay. regions for you know a lot of the reasons that we were just talking about how it's really difficult to manage particular plot points between different triads. In the campaign, never had the vision to set up and say the Church of Hieronius and Foltus and the other major gods, Saint Cuthbert or whoever, should be a flaness wide organization with s wide structure, leadership, missions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The campaign just didn't have the imagination and or manpower to make that leap. And then when we tried it late in the campaign, we were like, hey, look, you've got an organization for clerics of Paylor. We have an organization for clerics of Paylor. We really didn't in the UK, but I'm just using this as an example. They should be talking to each other. But like you said, you're a grad student. You're already doing 20 to 40 hours a week on this. How much more time could we give the campaign? Exactly. Uh, but yeah, just to circle back to what it was uh, uh, regionally, these would be organizations that um, you know, might exist in a, in a regular D&D home game. So, uh, for example, a Thieves Guild. right? You probably in your D&D game have a rogue who wants to be involved in the Thieves Guild and has that as a um, character story uh, plot point or something in their background. Um, you know, for clerics or paladins, uh, church uh, organizations, for um, wizards, uh, wizard academies, bard colleges, um, uh, military organizations, uh, things that uh, would be uh, very, very easy to fold into the life of a D and D home game. Uh, trying to recreate that in the living campaign space, uh, the answer for that was the the meta org to have something like that that uh, uh, a, a player character could belong to. Uh, that had uh, some vested interest yeah. in the uh, in the plot, and uh, allowed uh, for uh, oh, characters to explain to explain things that uh, maybe they were doing off screen or in between adventures. Right, I'm involved in my meta org doing mm -hmm. this thing at the Wizards Academy or doing this thing for the uh, uh, Thieves Guild, whatever it might be. And adventures might say, hey, this adventure, it would be good if you had someone from this meta or playing it. it it'd be in our blurbs in the Bandit Kingdoms. Uh, and our intro mods were actually always centered around a meta or. Yeah. So please note, any intro mods, yeah. Yeah. please note anyone out there watching that a lot of you, if you're running a Grail campaign, you're probably doing this now, except it's not in a campaign, it's not in Living Grail format where there's, uh, you gotta use certain uh, uh, time slots, right? For, for activities that are going on in the metal work each year and maybe some costs involved, but you get benefits from it. So right. you may be like in my game, you may be a member of the Guild of Bounty Hunters of Altamira, that would be considered a metal work if it was Living Greyhawk, as an example. Right. So um, it's pretty cool. And this is a listing of a lot of them here uh, in this year. And we talked about a couple of them. It's fantastic work, great detail. Um, I have to ask though, there's two monk meta orgs in here, two. 
Yeah. Order wow. of the Path of Honor and Order of the Silver Side. That's why I've been sitting here. I was like, wow, there's two of them. So, uh, yeah. Pretty neat. Lots of monks right. in Bissell classes? A lot of, uh, I don't know that there were a lot of monks in um, uh, in Bissell. I think the, uh, the, the original triad had... Um, I uh, had the idea that we wanted a, 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 a meta org for monks that were devoted to Hieronius because uh, it had been pasted in our masthead. Yeah. That, you know, Order of the Path know. of Honor. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, monks then, devoted to Hieronius, not axe or sword wielding shiny matter. knight bozos. Lawful, That's pretty neat. Lawful good. The, yeah, lawful good guys who. Hmm. Uh, um, do it a little bit I differently. It's, it's pretty neat. And, and not related to Sewell, because a lot of times in Greyhawk, the monks are associated with Sewell. Doesn't appear that way in this. Oh, well, That's awesome. through, the, through the Scarlet Brotherhood. Um, right. Right. Yeah. And then we had um, we, we had a player who uh, had this idea for um, monks who uh, uh, dressed up as kind of traditional. Um, uh, appearances of, of death or the Grim Reaper. Uh, and it seemed like a cool idea, so we, we let him run with it. And, Is that Dirk? Uh, Dirk Chin Lang? That was Dirk, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it says in here that he created Dirk. it, yeah. So that was, uh, Very yeah, cool. that was Dirk's creation. Um, so yeah, we had uh, a lot of, um, uh, I think, player input through uh, some of those uh, some of those meta orgs. Um, all of this is getting away from um, the uh, the question that I, I think Mike had stated a little bit earlier, which was, you know, do we ever have any non-human plots? Any dragons? Anything? Uh, we had um, there was a mist dragon hanging out in um, uh, an area of the Misty Hills. Um, there was supposedly a, a black dragon um, hanging out in um, the fetid fens, which is kind of the swamp area. Um, so yeah, but they they weren't really power players. They were um, uh, they were more kind of monster of the scenario type. Um, rather fights. than yeah, they they were exactly they weren't really. Um, uh, these were not genius dragons playing uh, four dimensional chess uh, against Evard and, and those sorts. Um, for non-human plots, we have um, uh, we have dwarves in the barrier peaks, All right. and a few scenarios touched on um, cultural interchange between um, humans living in the western area of Bissell and um, uh, those uh, dwarves who are living in the barrier peaks. Um, one of well, hang on, slow down. You're saying Barrier Peaks, which obviously begs the question, did um, any androids come down and do your adventures? You know, I think... Um, oh, boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, 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 the guys from um, uh, Joff beat us to that because they, hmm. they had a year one scenario that I thought was... It. A, okay. uh, yeah, they, they, they got to that, um, I think, before any of us. Um, we also had um, um, wood elves in the dim forest. Uh, but again, the, the dim forest was a kind of shared area, because um, uh, I think the, the guys in, in uh, again in Joff had uh, laid claim to a lot of things that were happening in the dim forest. Um, they have a, a, a shadow dragon in there that they were very proud of. Yeah, they talked um, about it at length. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was at that uh, convention where they uh, fight against the uh, Shadow Dragon, and I think my character, who was 14th or 15th level at the time, got innervated down to zero by the Shadow Dragon. <laughs> uh, so I was I was one of the casualties. Um, uh, again, a, a death. I don't know how glorious it was, but uh, <laughs> so you got up to 15th level. For the well, I started in year one, um, and yeah, I think by the end of it, my first LG character got to 15th level. And, and after 15th level, you were retired early in the campaign. You could get to 17th level, and retirement was at 18. Oh, that's true. They, ch they changed that. That was year three 
when they made the change. And we've talked to uh, our friend from Zyph, uh, Ikis, and he said they, re- they had multiple level 20 PCs somehow before the rule went into effect. And I'm like, I've done the math with TUs and experience points, and I'm just like, I want to audit those <laughs> character sheets. 15 years, those adventure records, because I don't buy it. Like, I know that PCs hit 18th level, and at Gen Con, the circle retired them because one of the wizards was using the wish spell to wish used experience points as a component of the spell. So when you were high up in 17th level and you were a wizard and you did not want to retire from living Greyhawk, last wish, and it sucked away 25,000 of your experience points, and you could play another adventure. <laughs> so at Gen Con, the 17th level wizard wished for the world's most perfect chocolate chip cookie. And at that point, the circle members who were nearby said, you're done, you're retired. This is ridiculous. We're making 18th level. Uh, And then they lowered it. That retirement was at, when you hit 16th level, you were retired. Yeah. Yeah. That is so, uh, yeah. Some of those rules that came out campaign wide, I, I had to believe that they were, spawn in exactly that way in response to some things that players were doing. Um, <laughs> were you I, I got Leap Attack in one of the RPGA card combos banned because I used it against Chris Tulak during a play test in Wisconsin and I, I so pissed him off with my 7th level half work part. Actually Garn, who I, I play on Jay's games. Um, I, I pissed off Tulak so much that they nerfed the combo. They made it an official you know, that you can't do it this way anymore. That's but, so great. But wow. it, there were things, what, what was happening in Bissell that, like, could uh, annoy you guys? Uh, was there anything anything you recall that was um, cheese? What We called it cheese banding. Oh, okay, yeah, no, we, uh, I, I, we use the same term. Um, were there, were there really cheese things? Um, there, uh, there was a prestige class you might remember called Lasher. Um, mm. Lasher was a was a whip, whip. expert. And, range, yeah. range attack with a whip. Yeah, even I know, yeah. I've even I heard about this. I've yeah. never heard of that one. <laughs> yeah, Lasher, yeah, we had a, we had, <laughs> we had some people uh, um, uh, take that to its uh, logical conclusion, which allowed you to make. Um, a, a ridiculous amount of t- attacks. And Plus disarming way. too. Couldn't you disarm with it? You you could you could do everything. <laughs> you could do everything with a whip if you were a lasher. Um, and then uh, that that got replaced once uh, once third edition became three point five. Um, that got be replaced uh, in in our hearts and minds. <laughs> With a uh, with a prestige class called the uh, uh, it was it the dervish or was it the dancing dervish? It was something the something whirling like dervish, something like that. Was, something like that. I think it was. Um, uh, yeah, it was. It was a scimitar specialist who could do like a crazy number of attacks, right? Same same idea. You could do a bunch okay. of attacks uh, with that. Um, yeah. so, we had yeah. the fate spinners in the bandit kingdoms doing okay. anticipate teleport. Which was a there was a splat book of spells, what the tome of magic or whatever, and anticipate teleport. If something was teleporting in on you, it delayed the bad guys for three rounds, and it, it gave you a warning so you could buff. And in the Bandit Kingdoms, all we ever did was teleport demons in on people because demons <laughs> can teleport, right? And so we just got super pissed off, and the Fate Spinner would make creatures re-roll all the time. So. Third edition, just I'm I'm kind of glad they're. Be anymore. thankful Tim never played in that era, or you guys would really get. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh man. I guess the the fate spinner. I, I remember the fate spinner, and that never really bothered us that much. Um, but our 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 plot relied on on undead mm. more than it did on um, demons or or other uh, teleporting foes. Mm. Um. And with undead, the, the nice thing about undead as a, um, as a as an enemy as a force to to bring against um, characters 
is that there's a huge spectrum. So you can cover a lot of different challenge ratings. Um, and there is a, um, a huge variety of undead that you can bring. So there's the, the fleshy undead who go in and hit people for a boatload of damage. Or there's the, um, uh, the incorporeal undead who are doing the ability damage. Um, and so you, you can go at it at different angles uh, in ways that um, um, players found ways to respond to, but um, they were never uh, they were never really overpowering, or at least they weren't overpowering in, in a way that annoyed me. Um, so so if, if, a, if a radiant servant showed up at the table and obliterated a bunch of undead with the power of Paylor, great, that's what they're supposed to do. Fine. Ah. Um, but you know the, we, we didn't have um, you know anything that really ruined it for us the way an anticipate teleport would ruin some teleporting demons. Yeah, we would have to learn to work around that. There was one other spell I, I mentioned in my my book uh, that we hated the one of, that prevented death. It was like if they died, but you cast it within one round of them dying, then they didn't die. Delay, delay death. Delay death, right? Something like that. Yeah. Oh, you they, know, could, you could, they could keep uh, living at zero hit points. I think that's what delay death did for you. Okay. We uh, yeah, yeah. There was there was a combination that involved uh, delay death with die hard. The yeah. Um, where you could still act yeah, uh, even though sure. you were yeah. at zero or, or negative hit points. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, that <laughs> uh, that that could be a. That could be a problem, though, because if you were on delay death and you were still fighting and you were you were you were raging and all of these things, um, uh, magic using in enemies can target a dispel. Right. Uh, so you know it's it's not a it wasn't a surefire thing, but it was uh, um, uh, it was it was you, it was a fun combination. I saw that happen a few times. We put delayed death on a monster because I got so pissed off players using it. <laughs> uh, we had a, a one of our big bad monsters in the making was Morgan Staller, a CR twenty one red dragon, <laughs> and he showed up at an interactive as the boss fight for an APL sixteen table. This was the first time they got to fight CR twenty one Morgan Staller, who was my baby. I didn't create Morgie, but I adopted him. And I gave Morgi a pet Jovok demon in third edition Monster Manual 2 or 4. A Jovok demon has aura of retribution. When it takes damage, everything within 30 feet of it takes damage. The same damage. And I advanced the hell out of the thing. So it went from like 56 hit points to 150 hit points or whatever. And Morgi shows up with the Jovok in his mouth. And an Iusian wizard had already cast Delay Death on the Jovok. And it gets funnier because the Jovok was actually given to by a Bandit King PC. He had captured it during an event. The judge had written down on the adventure record, captured a Jovok demon, player gave it to Morgan Staller the Red Dragon during scenario blah, 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 blah. And so he emailed us and said, by the way, your dragon now has a pet demon. You're welcome. Oh okay, cool. So Morgan Stoller shows up with this demon in his mouth that has delayed death on it. And Morgan Stoller was going to do a quickened breath weapon and then drop the demon and then do his full attack on the demon. And everything within 30 feet would take the damage done to the demon because of the delayed death spell. The demon would not die, no matter how much damage Morgan Staller did to it. But one of the players had an RPGA reward card that allowed them to act the surprise round. If you remember those, yeah. those cards. Wow. So his wizard, who had arcane sight up, said, oh, hey, what spells do I see that are up? And so I rattled them off. And when I said, oh, by the way, the demon's got delayed death on it, he got up, came across the table and shook my hand and then said, I cast magic on the Jovok demon and uh i never got to do full crazy i did the math one time it was going to do like 400 points of damage to everyone within 
like on average to, to hit <laughs> rolls. So yeah, it saved him from a TPK. That's crazy, but nuts. That was me being mad because the whole region was using this delayed death spell. <laughs> yeah, nuclear yeah. option. So yeah. Anna, Mike, you've been pretty quiet during this. You have oh, any questions? I'm just You're just I'm absorbing just, uh, it all. This is really oh, awesome. Yeah, and, and, yeah, but I'm still kind of mm. interested in Thornwood. What was the uh, the the end fate of the capital? Did they did back. the Kedites yeah. take it and kept it, or or did the Besselite regain it after? Or what happened after Ket? reinvaded so to speak so cat uh cat reinvaded and um uh they attacked the the walls of thornward <laughs> yeah um but you know at, at this point it, it's a it's a different bissell um after six years of having a conscripted military that you know is coming off a war footing against Evard and his hordes, um, the, the the invading Kedites find a, a very different um, uh, Bissell, uh, and um, and and what we did, I I, uh, I have to give credit to, to to Jay Babcock for this idea. We invaded Ket. Oh, uh, yeah. So a, a little little twist there is that um, uh, this 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 area. Right, but now north northwest of, of Thornward, uh, leading into to Ket, and we uh, we were pushing our armies in there uh, to uh, to begin to take the the fight to them. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what happened with with yeah Ket Ket reinvaded, um, and we were uh, um, <laughs> I, I suppose we could have relitigated. The, that story of conquest that had been so much a part of Bissell's history, um, but a, you know, at that point the script got flipped, and uh, um, and, and Bissell was uh, now Bissell was now the aggressor um, after having having been provoked in our defense. Right, the, mm -hmm. the way we set it yeah. up is that Cat. Um, had uh, sent some cavalry in to uh, test our uh, test our lines, test our defenses, um, and to see uh, see if there was any weakness there. And uh, uh, having having had that provocation, uh, Bissell started moving some armies uh, north uh, into Cat territory. So this is so Aaron's map shows a bunch of um, of of keeps along the defense, but then along the Rafa Road in Ket, there's all the way through Brandlewood. There's all these little uh, uh, locations. How far did you get? So yeah, we had um, we had an interactive that went into the Brandlewood, um, and um, um, fought in uh, fought in that area. I think that's probably as far as we got. Yeah, Darris, Minocair, Stevang, Mabound, Maldonius, Nesser, all the way along the road, I'm assuming, through the Brandable Woods. You got somewhere in there, and that's pretty neat. And for the audience, Kent as a region was Ontario, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, oh. Newfoundland, and Labrador in that's Canada. All over the place. It was like I, half, half of Canada. <laughs> I have no idea how close uh bissell connecticut maine massachusetts New hampshire rhode island and vermont i guess if you were all the way up vermont in yeah. in maine right yeah. that right. So, yeah. you might not be too far from newfoundland I, I don't even know and i live in massachusetts right um so yeah it, we had um we had some presence in um maine but but not a lot um and uh, I don't think we had any kind of mainline um, conventions or game days happening in Maine. We had um, a fairly active uh, community in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, um, some in Massachusetts, some in Connecticut. I, I would say probably the the mainstay of um, our play uh, action uh, was in the um, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, especially Boston, uh, but also in um, the UMass Amherst area, mm -hmm. um, 
Vermont, um, as far north as Burlington, uh, Concord, New Hampshire. These were kind of the main centers where, where games were uh, games were happening, um, which meant that um, a lot of our um, uh, a lot of our interaction with players. Uh, and with fellow triad members from the Backlunish West were uh, from uh, Quebec, which was Tuzman. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had um, we had good relationships there, and I um, and others uh, would travel up to um, uh, uh, Quebec to play in Tuzman. Uh, I think the first time I went up there, I, I traveled with Matt Pennington, who was uh, mm. on the triad. I was not on the triad at the time. But I mean, he was eager to travel around because you know he couldn't play in Bissell anymore. So right. you know he wanted to, hey, let's get a crew together and let's go to uh, Tuzmit, or let's drive down to Virginia and play uh, at this con and, and Jeff. And you know I would link up with uh, those guys, uh, with Matt Pennington and, and others, uh, sometimes Triad members who wanted to play in different regions. So right. they could actually play their characters. Um, My character Garn was created just so I could play in the Yeomanry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you know when I when I leaped onto that plot group. Um, all of a sudden, my um, my characters were moving to different <laughs> regions. Yeah. Um, so that I could uh, um, uh, I could have a, a tie into the the plot elements there. But yeah, Maine would be the, the natural kind of launching off point into um, the, the maritime provinces in, um, uh, in Canada. And um, I, I never had a cause to, to be up there or have um, uh, any conversations with the, the cat triad. I, again, you know, Jay, I think, was the, the spearhead to really um, – get us into uh into that plot line i mean i was in touch with jay at some point in the past few years uh i think on facebook but when i've reached out to him recently i didn't get a response so i i don't know i hope he's okay maybe he just gave up on the platform uh if you're in touch with any of those guys like i've reached out to matt pennington and he took a pass on tonight's show someone um someone on raj will do a future show someone on twitter named jay just followed me today hey. They might be. So I, oh, well. I'm, I'm not sure if it's he, but I can take a look um, right. uh, because it, it wasn't. Uh, so I'll, let me take a look here and see. But yeah. Um, but yeah. If you can spread the word with your fellow former Bissell guys, including we're hoping to have Conforti on. Conforti not only was Bissell Triad, but a circle member. And he wrote or orchestrated the Living Greyhawk Deities document. Still one of the most important Greyhawk references to this day, in my right. opinion. It's it's right after the Zavoda Index, um, you know, rest. So if you could get in touch with Bissell, folks, yeah. point them in my direction. We'll do a deep dive into the actual me meta orgs, because I can tell Jay's just itching to dive into each of these organizations, um, you know, deeper than we're doing tonight. Oh but gosh. we've had JP on from Tussman, by the way. Episode okay. thirty-five. If people want to wow. catch up, and, oh my gosh, we're uh, one thirty. We're one thirty-four. Yeah. Tonight. Oh my gosh, it was about two years ago, probably when we had JP. And JP was great because he's Duchy of Ernst and Tuzmit. He did That's both of the regions. Right. Yeah, when he moved yeah. Uh, uh, out to uh, to the states in uh, Colorado, I don't know who this J is right. Oh, he's County of Ernst, not Duchy. Right. He was exactly. He moved. Very cool. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's been uh, it's been tough because uh, there haven't been um, uh, really uh, in person uh, conventions. Uh, those have only just uh, started to uh, come out. Um, so yeah, if uh, if there are some in person conventions this year, I'm likely to uh, um, uh, run into uh, run into some of those guys, and uh, uh, hopefully, we can have them uh, have. Uh, um, uh, yeah, Jay or, or Matt, all those guys would be uh, great to talk to. Oh, cool. definitely. So I know. Uh, I look at that. We're almost at two hours there. See how quick it yeah. went, Cameron. It burns by, doesn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, awesome discussion. Thank so you. Uh, what ha- What did you, you stopped playing? Did you keep a group going together? And, and by the way, uh, so you played your Amanda mandolin that that came up also. You used to oh, play. Oh wow. Instrument. Okay. Yeah, uh, that wasn't that. That that happened one time. So I um uh, I, I have uh, I have some musical ability, um and uh, I don't get to I don't get to play as much as I, I used to, but there was Casey. You might remember there was a uh, there was a core module absolutely that um had as its plot point um uh. The magic of, of Otto's irresistible dance is permeating the streets, and and it, the 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 plot of the scenario winds up being kind of the uh, like the musical Buffy episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hush, I think. No, Wasn't no, that? there's a musical uh, one. There's a full musical. Uh, the musical one, one. yeah, Hush yeah, is yeah, great yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, no, the, it's the it's the musical episode from uh, uh, I want to say season six of Buffy, uh, but uh, somebody may have may have seen this and said i want to do this as a as a living greyhawk module um okay. because all of the um uh, all of the encounters were um musical or theatrical in in style um there was some magical effect that allowed you to add your charisma modifier to all your uh, attacks and damage rolls um so all of a sudden the bards were just were, were the gods of the battlefield, um, the bards and the sorcerers. Um, and uh, they had included as a, um, uh, as a, as, as a, a moment to uh, explain what's happening in this scenario. Um, someone, I wish I could remember the, the name of the scenario and the author. It's not strike any bells for me, but I didn't play a lot of cores that didn't involve Brindigan. I tried to explain the Brindigan stuff to Jay at one point, and he just thought it was ridiculous. Magic item that would return to the seller and, and just screwed over years worth of it's, living it's talk a, PCs. It's an awesome idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it, as part of the scenario, there was a there was a, a, a handout that had this this full twenty line poem um, that explains the full plot. And wow. when I was when I was preparing this, I was going to run it with for my friends, and I looked at this and I said, "I'm going to set this to music." Uh, so I. Um, uh, I got it, and um, I want to say, oh, uh, Jim is in the chat. Yeah, he says, and Cam wrote a song about it on the mandolin. Um, yeah, so I, I performed it for them in uh, in Jim's living room, uh, actually, as we were uh, as we were playing, and uh, uh, I guess uh, I guess they they remembered that. Um, <laughs> I, I would never forget that. That's amazing. Um, My players I, just usually get bad jokes and farts out of me. They got music we, uh, from you. Yeah, no, we, we do we do a lot of that too. Don't don't worry. Um, it's it's not all uh, it's not all songs and, and dancing. Um, yeah, so I, I did that, and uh, I, I want to say somebody somebody must have recorded it on their phone. Um, oh wow! Those were the days. Those were the days. Um, uh, I don't think we had iPhones in those days. I think we had no. Blackberries. Um, uh, so, so somebody may have recorded that. I don't know though. Uh, well, they should so, dig that up and send it to me. Uh, right, or post it on YouTube. That could be. Uh, yeah, post yeah. it on YouTube. Send me the yeah. link, and <laughs> after your semester is over, we'll. I'm trying to do some broad shows this year where I want to do a Sheldamar Valley, where I get one triad member from each of the regions and or the circle guy, you know, to come on yeah. and we talk about the meta regional plot arcs and meta regional meta orgs and things like that oh yeah that'd be fabulous yeah it's very very cool so so um in closing uh there cameron what would you like to what would you like to say man i, I really appreciate you coming on and really because yeah, we'll yeah yeah definitely got a lot of great information wow um so you know all obviously all of this would have been uh impossible without the uh players that we had in new england 
uh, over the course of uh, Living Greyhawk. So um, uh, certainly a, a shout out um, to uh, everyone, uh, everyone there. Um, the people who are administering um, the the Bissell region, uh, we've mentioned a few names already. Um, I'd be remiss if I, I, I'm probably not going to remember everybody's name, but we had uh, uh, Kevin Hogan, Dana Schlosser in the uh, early years, uh, Matt Pennington, John Williams, uh, who did a lot of great work uh, in year two and year three. Um, I think we've mentioned um, uh, Max, uh, now Salt and Saul, uh, Raj Shah, Chad Brown, uh, Jay Pennington, and then um, uh, Matt Miranda came on uh, late um, uh, in the uh, in the campaign, uh, and we had a lot of other great volunteers: uh, Don Walker, Mike Hallett. Uh, we had. Um, um, uh, Nepal's and Taurus, who did a lot of merch for us. Uh, I, I, I was I was showing you guys uh, b before we went on. Yeah, um, please do. So now we a, need a to see it. Yep. Yeah, a, a lot of a lot of regions had um, uh, shirts. You know, most regions had like T-shirts uh, or yeah, apparel. Um, so we had a guy on uh, Nepal's and Taurus who uh, made a lot of stuff, and um, he got these. They're these like they're they're frosty mugs. With the, uh, the the Bissell um, heraldry on it, and uh, I I got one from him, and I, I kept it. It's just been uh, in the back of my freezer, uh, and every once in a while I dig it out. Um, so yeah, this is some of those little uh, mementos, uh, and uh, those uh, um, um, uh, things that we have as uh, as as relics of the Living Greyhawk campaign uh, have been really great to hold on to. My uh, uh, my T-shirts from those era don't, don't fit too well, uh, you know. Now, uh, uh, yeah, me neither. Later, but, uh, um, but I've been able to keep this, and it's been uh, it's been great. Uh, so yeah, definitely the it's the uh, it's the players and um, to and the volunteers effect, yeah. who, uh, who 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 made it um, uh, who made it great, and uh, you know it's it's wonderful to be able to do something special for people that they remember like living Greyhawk, like uh, uh, playing the mandolin i guess uh for people just to, to 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 do things like that to create memorable gaming experiences and i think uh and living Greyhawk, uh casey as you as you mentioned uh is is one of those that um you know as a uh, as an event as a as a campaign as a as a as a multi-year uh um uh, experiment and kind of regional storytelling uh, is uh, is an important landmark uh, in the history of the hobby. One last question: Who has the Bissell Shield? Who has the Bissell Shield? Okay, so um, I, I knew that question was going to come up. I <laughs> never saw or touched the shield. Um, I want to say it's probably uh, if I if I had to guess, Steve Conforti's got it. Okay, um, I'll ask him. But uh, I I don't know. He would be he would be top of my list of suspects. I don't know who would be okay. second on my list of suspects. But see, here's the thing: those shields were given out to randos with tickets at yeah. Gen Con, right? They had to do that live action dungeon or whatever, and then they could just the randos who might not even be involved with the Greyhawk could get the shield. So then other people were going up to them and making them offers. Or living Greyhawk people got shields from other regions. Like, what was it Conrad told us? He ended up. Yeah, he with ended the, up with, which I forgot which. So who ended was. up with the uh, Ayu shield? Someone. Brit made... has a the Bandit Kingdom shield. Yeah, I believe maybe the Ayu one. I forget, yeah, but yeah. And they had to trade. There was some trading at Gen Con, so I, I'm not sure who's got what. I should make a little. I thought I started making a database and send it to you, Jay. Yeah, the other, and then the other thing to um, uh, to complicate that is that the uh, the heraldry for Bissell kind of looks like the heraldry for the Shield Lands. Um, yeah, it does. Well, that shield got know. used on all the heraldry, the the, the icon, the tower. So yeah, that um, uh, that might uh, that might complicate the uh, provenance of that. <laughs> very cool. So, uh, Cameron, anything in closing tonight? Thank you so very much. 
Uh, no, this was uh, this was great. It's uh, you know, like I said, uh, kind of before we went on, uh, I hadn't really uh, um, uh, devoted this much uh, time and reflection to uh, Living Greyhawk. So it's been been great to uh, uh, revisit this uh, with, with you, you guys who are really interested in the in the setting and and uh, um, who uh, know a lot about it as well. So uh, this has been this has just been a great conversation. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you very here? much. Anything you'd like to shout out that you're doing now or that you want to bring to our attention, please, if you, if there's something. I Yeah, I don't uh, – most of my uh, gaming stuff is uh, um, uh, more on the um, uh, smaller scale. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just uh, – for, for those of you who are uh, – working on, on cataloging this Greyhawk stuff, uh, more power to you because it's just, uh, it's a really great project. Thank you. You, you don't want to spend a couple of years of your life doing the Bissell <laughs> version. I think it's yeah, by Watsi and yes, they're having yes, a yes, lot yes, of, uh, Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've, yeah, we've got, we've got something like that, which is, uh, uh, well, not, not like that. Um, in, uh, in, in scope or, or comprehensiveness, but we had we had an updated uh, campaign book. Um, uh, I, I know um, uh, Anna, you 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 were able to get a hold of the uh, mm -hmm. gazette here. I got the earlier version. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have a Someone later version that me. I need to um, the, that I need to uh, get to you. It's funny. I you know, I was I, today I, I decided to look up the the article on on Evard. Um, and in that, there's some reference to the uh, Bissell Omnibus, which was our, our later document. Um, so somebody had it and edited this article on Evard. Um, so it must be circulating out there. I, I am not hosting any uh, any site that you could have to, to download it, but um, you know, hmm. I'll, I'll send it your way and then you can do with it what you will. Okay. Awesome. Cool. It Anna, I don't know if I mentioned this yet tonight, but Cameron, Anna has probably read more of the Living Greyhawk adventures and meta materials than anyone else on the planet because she was data mining for her yeah, map data, project. Yeah, for my map. So yeah. I read everything through at least once, every module. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. It's, it's a couple, several hundred. It's like three, four hundred or something like that. All I, all, I, think. I can't imagine the contradictions you've had to sift through. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a mess. And the interesting with Living Red Hawk, the quality is like, I wouldn't say zero, but it's like from one, two, all the way up to ten. So <laughs> so it spans the whole gamut of, of, of quality when it comes to Greyhawk content. Some of the best content is Living Greyhawk some of the absolute worst is great living yeah. and i can tell some of them are made by some of the best authors in the industry with plenty of time and they've done their back study some of it seems to be like someone wrapped it up on a thursday to run it on a friday <laughs> night or something like that in in yeah. as an adventure and yeah. no back checking no whatsoever you just need a filler here somewhere right, right. So, so yeah it spans yeah. the whole quality spectrum so to speak right yeah you know, one of the things i i know we're trying to wrap up but um okay. casey you might appreciate this we uh one of the things that we tried to do in Bissell with all our regional scenarios was be able to cover all APLs. Oh, so, nice. So wow. all, of our, all of our regional scenarios starting, probably starting with year five, but definitely by year six, um, every regional scenario covered APL two through 12. That's and, insane. Uh, yeah. So they were, they were wound up with these huge appendices with lots of stat blocks. Um, and uh, you try to you, you try to use the monster manual whenever you can um, uh, to save time, but it's sure. not always possible. Well, and you ran into the same thing we probably did. The players are home dungeon masters, or they're living Greyhawk dungeon masters, and they know those monsters inside and out. You know, the three point X was a couple years old. No, was even older. You throw a standard mind flare at them, and they would just go bing, bam, boom. Three rounds later, it's dead even if it was supposed to be a deadly encounter. But then when you write an adventure and you're like, I'm going to give it templates and weird abilities. Next thing you know, your, your adventure is six pages of text and 40 pages of mont. Yeah. You know, if you, if you're lucky, uh, you can hone it down to that length. Yeah. 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 A quick question. Is that a dungeon on the wall behind you? Uh, like yeah, it. actually, I have a I have a poster of the Tomb of Horrors uh, behind me. Oh, oh cool! Oh, nice. nice, nice man. Uh, yeah, I, that that was uh, that was another one that was uh, insert and in, in one of the magazines, either Dungeon or Dragon, and I I 
kept it, and I was like, mm, when I get when I get a wall, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that up. Yeah, you really flaunt your your DM credential, uh, Greyhawk or or yeah. D and D credentials here in the background. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So what a great discussion tonight. We need to get we need to keep it rolling here with uh, Living Greyhawk for this for 2022, and I'm sure we will. Right, Casey? I'm sure we. Yeah, will. that's the plan. Months. Once a month. It yep. Is my goal. I think I said last year I bought a house, changed jobs, and just wasn't able to do as many shows as I would have liked to. This year is looking a little bit better. So if you guys, Mike and Anna and Jay, will have us, oh, yeah, we'll do definitely. one yeah. a month. And I've got some dates. I've got. I'm in touch with other Bissell guys that Cameron has mentioned, Raj, and I'm waiting to hear back from a couple of others. And hopefully we can do another Bissell part two. Yeah, we uh, Eric Mangay and Jose, who's in the audience. Jose, uh, J J E J O R T I Z yeah. was a Joff Tribe member, Cameron, yeah. who's in our audience tonight. Yep. Um, so we'll get those guys back on and get Judy on. And um, I've got a whole bunch of ideas for shows awesome. this year. Awesome. Maybe looking forward to it. What yeah. else is going on, Casey? Oh, God. So I'm still waiting. Well, I, hang on. Let me start from scratch. I don't want Christoph to think I'm busting his stone. In the next Earth Journal, I have an article on the town of Seton due out. I think I've mentioned this oh. a couple of times and that I'm running Goats of Salt March for my home campaign, 5E, once a month uh, on Saturdays. I do an eight-hour session. We do it remotely because of COVID, and we're approaching – I think our third year anniversary for the campaign. And uh, so anyway, I wrote an adventure in the town of Seton as a filler because Ghost of Salt Marsh has various gaps in its uh, design. And it involved uh, Lord Obmi. I use his bone shadow because in canon, Lord Obmi is wanted for murder in Keeland. It actually says that in Against the Giants. I think it's page 27 of one through three or something like that. It's the weird stuff my brain remembers. So I was going to have my 5e players have to fight Lord Omni, and I didn't like how they presented him in Tales from the Yawning Portal against the Giants. Oh, really? So I've got a 5e Omni who just kicks the ever-living snot out of anyone he ever runs into, which is the way it should be. Omni's awesome. So after I ran this adventure for my home group, I was like, I've, I've fleshed out Seton here a little bit. There's no canon info on Seton other than it's a town near Salt Marsh. <laughs> so I got inspired by the Welsh town of Conway. I think it is C-O-N-Y-W-Y or something like that. And it's, uh, um, it's on the ocean and it's got a castle and it's exactly like I imagined. Seaton would be and so I wrote this article and I submitted it to Christoph uh, to publish in the Earth, Earth Journal and Gary Holian co-author of the Living Greyhawk Gazetteer and our Keeland expert fact-checked it and reviewed it for me and gave me some advice on some of the things to do with the article which I'm really excited about everyone seeing it wow when the next OJ comes out it's like the first non bandit Kingdom thing awesome. I've ever done very cool. Um, so yeah, really excited oh, about. No carry awesome. at all tonight. Yeah. Well, he's probably got something. Yeah, I'm gonna him. get a little mad at <laughs> that he didn't show up. <laughs> yeah, it could be he had some family stuff, uh, kids stuff with school. Yeah. So you never know. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. kids. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming on tonight, and uh, we'll keep things rolling. And Casey's character actually survived Tim's game Saturday morning, which is an, a feat in itself. Well, I left early. Yeah, so. <laughs> but smart. we'll have the underdogs continue whenever, uh, you know, next time Tim DMs that on a Saturday morning. So, uh, Mike, what's up, man? Well, Cameron, thank you for coming on. Uh, once again, Living Greyhawk shows me that there's parts of the worlds of Greyhawk I've never used. You know, it's been like flyover territory for me. And you've made Bissell sound interesting. Yes. Okay, cool. That's great. Yeah, yeah I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> so that's all I have to say on that. Um, otherwise, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, next week's topic. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm saving it as a tidbit to put that up. I haven't even shouted that out yet. I was about yeah. to say, what is it? Ah, we're going to wait. We'll see. We're going to wait. Yeah, that we'll way, wait. I forced Anna to go quick, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's going on, Anna? 
Uh, well, oh yeah, it's 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 a lot, but hopefully it will not take too long to 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 talk about. It. I just dropped another preview of the 2022 Flanny mm -hmm. Sepona land map for for my for my patrons. Uh, well, it's just a small a small one. Uh, it's kind of finalizing the 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 terrain map. Uh, I added polar ice pack and stuff that kind of matches the the Earth planet model, and and also a lot of of Adri and and Inspa updates and thanks to Frank Roters for for helping me sort out the 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 Adri and and Inspa kind of conundrum and we got it almost right there's a couple of things I forgot to delete so so I need to to get them sorted out there will be another test update coming in a couple of days hopefully this weekend I can get it I have a double uh, I have a game session Saturday and a game session Sunday that I'm running. So so you will probably might be pushed until Monday and I get it. And I will test out an imperial border level for the Great Kingdom because that way we can keep baronies and stuff at the local level and then we have a provincial level and then a national level and an imperial level on top. I think that can work out good for things like like the great kingdom and and so on so i'm going to to try out the colors and and kind of work and then and the, do a, a test run so that is coming fairly soon and then there's also a batch of heraldry coming very soon too i'm not sure exactly how many but i think it's like in the range of 20 or so and, nice. and, and so, so that is coming too. And and then there will be another update next week on the first look at the Atlas where I'm, I have to divide up the map into 11 by 17. And we have to kind of, so I'm going to do a test layout early next week on that. So that is coming too. And then it's just to, to, to kind of nail it down and hopefully, uh, Two more updates on on the the 576 2022 edition map, and we can go into release candidates, so to speak, because I don't get that many typos and stuff like that anymore. So it seems to have stabilized. In the beginning, I got like 20, 30, 40 comments, emails, and stuff every time I send out a preview. So so, but now it's starting to to nail down. There's um, some uh, Isle of Dread. Need I need to read through the uh, the the whole kind of adventure path and and Gary Holian have hopefully had some some sum ups of of the the different uh, settlements and stuff because i thought that isle of dread was kind of uninhabited that's very true, far yeah. from the case yeah. is a whole bunch of little settlements and 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 various old sites and and god knows what so so i need to to read through that so that will be something i will do next week i will i will try and and, and sift through all the the the, the stuff from the uh, savage tide a campaign and and the Isle of Dread and I, I will not read the whole thing. I will simply search for everything that is on the map and see what I can find and figure out if it's a town or a city or or, or just a, a runestone somewhere or just a monster lair or whatever. So, because some of the names are kind of very ambiguous, you don't know what it is. Some of it is more kind of obvious what it is on the map. So, and I also want to to shout out for Darlene's letter Topia. She is doing some awesome work on on Greyhawk fonts coming in, and she just dropped. Uh, uh, I got the the post update while we had the show here, so <clears throat> so she's working on getting the the another Greyhawk font done, and that will be the political alphabet from the Greyhawk nice. map as a font. So it's coming, I and I don't know that. how long because she is she doesn't do things lightly meaning this one will be perfect so 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 she's working on it so, so shout out to darlene fun. for her recent open letter to the community yes, that's, that's all another, i'm gonna say yeah, about that, that was that. another one that was yeah crazy. yeah Slam. anyone no, who the, the 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 new tsr tsr3 or whatever they they go under that justin lanasa and stuff did and they wanted to drag darlene into the lawsuit or something over over copyright so wherever it is and darlene wrote a wonderfully uh, authored uh, rebuttal and and kind of uh, kind of basically outed uh, Justin Lanasa and 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 all what he was doing in a very very well and that that got its round on Ian world and and a whole bunch of stuff so that was very very so much kudos to Darlene for 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 stepping up yeah. to to that was wonderful so yeah so she's up to a lot of, of good stuff so 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 yeah so more and more more is coming and hopefully we can wrap up the the 2022 
the 576 map in a couple of weeks and then move into the Atlas and the 598 map. And thanks to Cameron's awesome, and I now, now have some Bissell updates on the 598 map to do. So thank awesome. you so much for that. Yeah. Very, very cool. All right. So what's, we'll start. This starts four streams and five nights, by the way, everyone. So Wednesday, Thursday, nothing Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But what's going on next week? I, I, I've, I've hidden it enough. So Mike's idea here, we're going to give it a shot. The artwork of Greyhawk. Ooh. Okay. Yes, he pulled that That's one. That's a good out. one. Yes, thank you. And that was Mike's idea. And, uh, yeah, we're I gonna, think it's good. Yeah. We're going to give that one. Absolutely. A, we're going to give that one a uh, going to give that one a shot next Wednesday. Um, discuss, um, you know, discuss your favorite ones uh, all the way through. Um, we're going to try and keep it the Greyhawk and uh, and then see what. Uh, yep, going to be a, an interesting discussion tomorrow night. We continue. Like, where did Casey get this? Guy yeah. yeah, we have to ask. <laughs> so, so yeah. that from middle. That's middle or ages, isn't that middle ages? Yeah, this is public domain art. Yeah, it's public domain yeah. from the middle ages. Yeah. Absolutely. Thursday night. I'm poor. <laughs> I can't pay off the uh, artists. I mean, I do pay my artists. Thursday night, we finish uh, adventure number 938. Uh, logistics and supplies. Yes. So that will be to uh, tomorrow night with a, Reaper, a, a double Reaper giveaway. We had one last week. We're doing it again because i got so many special events this month. Uh, i got some other sponsors covering some stuff. That is Thursday. Everyone knows there's a monster game Saturday night, 6 p.m., right? Everyone knows... That for the first time ever in history, uh, Luke Gygax and Ed Greenwood are going to play in the same D&D game. First time ever. That's nuts that this is the first time ever this is happening. Well, yes, but the, it was the first time that, that Eric Mona and Ed Greenwood played the last time I, I ran for Ed's group. So right? We have so first. this is a yeah. first, yes. And uh, Luke's been really kind of uh, shouting this out all over today. You may have seen it on Facebook or Instagram. So, um, yeah, and we also we have Eric Boyd, Eric Mengi, Tony Winslow, Brill, and Anna. So what a group that's going to be. And the group Two Do Drink Minimum is the name of the Edge group that they you know, yep. mm -hmm. uh, went off. And we rotate a special guest in. It just so happens to be Luke Gygax this time. So uh, that'll be on Saturday. And then Sunday, um, they made this up for me. And uh, um, yeah, here is the – here. Um, so I'm going to show this instead. Uh, Gavin – we have Fantasy Ground Academy on. We're going to have a discussion with them. Le the, the great Laren and Balfrin will be joining me uh, to discuss VTTs uh, when it comes to your use. So um, this will be a really good uh, a good gab and where we go a little yeah. outside of my I need to watch zone. that. Yeah. I'm getting sick of Roll20. Yeah, oh, well, it's going to be a good one because uh, we're going to use Unity. I have it. I bought it in Kickstarter it's to support fantasy them. Grounds. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so it'll mm -hmm. all be Fantasy Grounds, and it's going to be a really uh, in-depth uh, on this and uh you know can't wait to uh, get that rolling and then remember i got specials every saturday this month so um we we got a crafting one the week after and we got the slav squad squad a week after that so i got like four or five sh and we got the fancy mapping show with anna and Alyssa on the uh on the 21st we got like i got four streams a week minimum five on that week with the fancy mapping show so uh, wonderful things coming up. Um, and thank you all for the support. We're going to keep things rolling in the industry. Let's give away three giveaways. Let's do it. Last call. If you have not. One hard copy. The monster. So and please be in the continental U.S. Monster Mythology reprint. Two. Canadians. Too bad. Two, two digital <laughs> copies of the Player's Archive Troller Games. All righty. Last call. I think you're both in. Um, yep. the, the shipping to Canada is crazy. Rich. It's nuts. Bonja Talos got a signed copy of my book and I had to send it to his sister-in-law in Austin, Texas so that she could take it to Canada when she went there for Christmas. It, it, it's nuts. It, it, it truly is nuts. Um, I, I've, Prometheus, I sent it to his wife who was in California. Uh, all right, I'm setting up, closing out the entries. All righty. Uh, please tell me what you want. I'm assuming the first person that wins will want this monster mythology, which is a great reference. This is a great book. So if you like deities and you like um, oh, that's the one with the lizard folk gods and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah. This is, yeah. This okay, is really, gotcha. This is really I may good. have had that as a kid, but really, I don't know really where it is book. now. It's a great so, one. It's, it's yeah, fantastic. you're already in. I saw you already in. So here we go. The first winner. Grape Ape again. All right. Oh, Grape Ape won last time, too. So awesome. uh, as long as, uh, as, long as Matt is on. Stand Matt, out. I already sent yours out. Matt, which one do you want? Do you want this or do you want the, uh, do you want the Troller game uh, digital? Your call. 
Uh, so let me know which is which one you want, Grape. You tell me because. Um, okay, so the next two are reprints. Here we go. The next two get these, and I'll give you the codes tonight. Oh, Alcimine, grats. All right. All right, good. Uh, great. See, you mentioned my book in the chat, and you win prizes. Alcimine yeah, told it. me they had my book. That's it. Matt played in the BK tourney and has my book. Yeah, it's that's good luck. <laughs> and lastly, here we go, last winner. Oh, I almost, oh man, I almost hit end, didn't I? I always do that. Last winner. Commander Meerkat. Wow, that's I don't know if Commander Meerkat's ever won before. Let me make sure. Is Commander Meerkat on still? Looks like it. So Commander Meerkat, as long as you're on to claim, you are good. And uh, uh, I'll let you, you can always reach out to me via um, uh, Whisper. Um, I will attempt to get you, but I see you at least lurking in the middle. So we got everything going out. Grats. And let's raid into um, – Stella's doing her uh, – her Greyhawk game tonight, if I'm, I'm pretty sure. So it's a good night to raid into Stella, um, who probably will be in the fundraiser. Oh, by the way, Eric, um, last thing. I'm sorry. I have to – we have nine channels right now, and we're looking to get more for There Be Dragons, the fourth annual Greyhawk Mega Stream fundraiser event. All right. I want to raise more. We did 10000 and 20 – I checked the totals. $10,021 last year. Let's beat that this year. All the channels you see on there have committed – I got the message. Eric Mona is in for my finale. You know, my Saturday night finale. Venerian Vord will be back for this for this uh, great game, uh, and I'll look to see get some more people. Such a in. slimy character it, he it, created. It's such a great, great cleric character. of Ralish. Yes. Uh, it is that. awesome. Thank you. And so um, I'll get you more details as we start finalizing everything. Uh, to uh, you know, but it's going to be three days. Gonna be, we're going to have extremes after mine on Saturday just to have some on Sunday for, for channels that want to participate. So note, uh, we're, we're really excited about that. And that's – get more details on the St. Jude fundraiser for 2022, um, and that will be uh, February 18th, 19th, and 20th. All right. Uh, everyone, uh, Cameron, thank you. Casey, yeah. thank you. Anna and well, Mike, thank, th you. thank you. Oh, and, thank uh, you. And let's read to Stella. Yep. And oh, Med, I appreciate you uh, jumping into the Counterfire Discord. So uh, stick stick around and uh, join the community. There's a lot going on with us uh, and uh, multiple channels and multiple discussions. We'll see you all tomorrow night for my game, uh, 7:30, and then uh, Saturday 6 p.m. Eastern is the big game with uh, Ed Greenwood and and uh, and Luke Gygax. See you all. Uh, see you all tomorrow night. Have a good. Keep week. everyone's fingers crossed. I'm working on Ket for February. That'd be awesome. Oh, That'd be awesome. awesome. Yep. Chat to you all soon. See ya. All right. Setting up the raid. Dun, dun, dun. Cameron, thanks again. Yes. Yeah, thank you. For coming on. This was fantastic. Yep. Wonderful discussion. We're going to at, at least double Stella's, triple Stella's audience. Yeah, uh, all right. 77 thanks. going in. Five, four, three, Good night, everybody. two, one. See you tomorrow night. Thank you. That's a monster rage. She had 35 watching. Now we got added 77. Yeah. Very great. Very cool. All right, let me just make sure it went. I think so. Yeah. 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 Hey, this was a lot of fun. I, I, you know, I had a great time. And I, I feel like we just scratched the surface. That's the good thing about bringing you back. Always the case on these shows. Two hours go past. In the beginning, it feels like we have an eternity of time. And then halfway through, we haven't even started with one of the scrape the.